How do you follow up a movie widely regarded as one of the greatest horror films ever made? Well, if you said make a made-for-TV sequel where they write out the main character, jump around the timeline, and infuse some psychedelic rock, you are very wrong. We took a look at Look What's Happened to Rosemary's Baby for our final Halloween movie of the year, today on Nothing Spookies. It's getting a little nippy out there. Well, no, it's more like this with the sunshine mm -hmm. and like the fall vibe. The autumn colors and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just biking here. I feel like I could hear like... Perfect, yes. And it's finally starting to get like cool. It's finally starting to get like actual actual autumn weather. Yes, I know. Oh, The evenings are getting cool, but like it's supposed to be like 23 degrees right now. I'm really sick of all these people saying, oh, the weather's so nice right now. It's not nice. It's not supposed to be this warm. It's apocalyptic. Yes, it's maybe not good. Maybe we shouldn't be happy about this. We're going to have a really cold winter. Just, just hate to say that. But that's what we're saying. Out there. Yes, yeah. That's the trade off. There's no, and then we're going to have like two weeks of like nice fall weather. Yeah. And then I'm just gonna I'm gonna be I'm gonna be obnoxious about it. Oh. I'm gonna have like eight scarves on. You're gonna have your four auto, coffees. Yeah, your yeah. your pumpkin spice latte. Everything's whatever. gonna be pumpkin. Pumpkin kicks. You hipster pumpkin, nonsense. The the pumped up kicks. Pumpkin streaks in my you pumped up kicks. Yeah. And then instead of the the Air Jordan pump, it's a pumpkin. Mm. Yeah. Well, you that, better run, better run faster than my bullet. I gotta get, uh, yeah, I gotta get my guy on that. I got a shoe guy. Mm. It's not a big deal. Gotcha. Welcome back, however you wish to self-identify, to Nothing Spookies. <gasps> I'm gonna miss saying that. Yeah. Uh, where we ask the question, its eyes. What have you done to its eyes? Oh, yeah. That's a reference to the movie Rosemary's Baby, mm -hmm. which we watched together two weeks ago, so I'm not surprised you don't remember. No, I, re I remember that. It was just like, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, that was a line from it. Yeah. That, well, I uh, feel like I should have... Uh, I meant to rewatch that. I'm busy, guys. I couldn't rewatch that one, too. That's fair. I it's, know. You know. It's it, my favorite movie. I should know stuff. Well, then you got it, stuff you got it, it in your head. You well, got it in your... No, we'll how many see. times would you say you've seen it? You know what's funny is that I've seen it far less than a lot of movies, but it is, I would say it's my favorite movie, but I've probably seen it 10 times. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Great. Probably 10, yeah. Cool. Well, we're going to get into it. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, but this is the podcast where we go through an actor's filmography and we choose the most anonymous and culturally untalked about movies that they've made and decide whether or not they've got a certain something <laughs> or if they're the spawn of Satan. I'm Kaz Lesgard. And I'm the spawn of Satan. No, no, I'm, I'm Jameson Rafter. Oh, see yeah. Veritus. And today, we're discussing the 1974 television film, Look What's Happened to Rosemary's Baby. <laughs> what a title. Um, like, it sounds like, like what you say to someone out there so they wake up out of a coma. The a, last thing they saw was Rosemary's Baby. Well, when you go... <laughs> what happened here? Look at it! Look, look, look what they've look, done to it! <laughs> When you go on IMDb and you search what's happened to, there's actually quite a few films that are whatever happened to. Yeah. So I don't know if it was a thing. Like if oh, they, it was like a convention of the time. It might have been a convention yeah. where they were like, let's make TV movies and let's like reap the benefits of these popular films mm -hmm. and we'll rehash. There's like anyway. a, and not pay the original author anything or something I like mean, that. Because... Cop <laughs> copyright triple question mark is my first note. <laughs> now I'm just thinking of like all of like these TV movies that I want to see that, that have that convention. Like, look what happened to Cool Hand Luke? Yeah. yeah. Look, what a, what an amazing legal loophole that would be if you want to get like the bullshit rights to something. Like, hey, it's just sort of in name only, right? Look what happened to Spartacus. Yeah. Still dead. Yeah. Still crucified. Mm. Well, I feel like probably in the courts and like the legal stuff is what gummed it all up because it stopped. Like they don't do it anymore. Right. Mm. Like the convention of this. Anyway, we can get into the seventy. The seventies was it a wild west of, it of TV. Never happen. Yeah. It should. You know what? Maybe it should. In this era of clean and sanitized Disney Plus specials, maybe they should bring it back. Uh, yes, look what look what's happened to Rosemary's Baby. It is a title that my brain wants to autocorrect as I'm saying it mm -hmm. uh, to either um, uh, whatever happened to Baby Jane or Look Who's Talking. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Which it basically is a hybrid of. Yeah. It really is. Yeah, yeah. It's look look who's talking to Rosemary's Baby Jane yeah. now. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is a movie that I suggested we watch based on a prompt from, from our guest here and now that I've uh, seen uh, it uh, I feel like maybe I should apologize because uh uh, I don't think this is a horror movie. <laughs> I don't actually know what genre no. this movie is, other than 
nonsense other, yeah. other, other uh, how, than how, other than 70s bullshit like i don't to, really know what's going on it's how to fill simply, up an not, hour, simply to, not scary how to fill up an hour and a half of television time in 1976 or whatever yeah are we gonna introduce our guests yeah. we will we, because we have a very uh very exciting guest with us today uh as an actor you've seen her as officer daisy corber on cw's the flash Ooh. and you can catch her soon in the upcoming netflix sitcom blockbuster she's also a filmmaker whose new short film consumer is currently making the festival rounds our guest today is stephanie isaac here I am. You're, you're here. Welcome to the show. And you hey, spoke yeah. before you were introduced, which is what we like. Which oh, is what we, Which oh, is what okay. we want to happen. Yeah. It's so all... you're winning. Good. Oh, and, God. But you've done, you've done podcasts before. So you know, you're not new to this. You know. I've done a couple. I've done a couple vet. and I, well, I listen to a lot. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. Great. Stephanie. Mm-hmm. Thanks mm. so much for coming. It's so Thank nice. You for having me. So nice to see you. I haven't seen you in so long. No. Uh, yeah. So um, I was asking you um what you would like to do on the podcast here and i mentioned that uh, you know we're in the midst of two months of halloween and i yes. saw on instagram that you have a uh, new short horror film coming out which is very exciting we'll talk uh, some more about that so i wanted to pick your brain about uh horror movies mm. and uh you brought up the subject of rosemary's baby I and did. so i uh i i did uh, some search and i typed rosemary's baby into the thing i'm like what movies are like Rosemary's Baby. What's like a ripoff of Rosemary's Baby that we and can talk about? And you found something much better. And, and then much I found cheaper. out there's a Dane sequel. There's a Dane TV sequel that I had never heard of before. Oh my gosh, Kaz. Well, that makes me feel a lot better about myself because I was having a little bit of shame when you pitched that to me, and I was I just thought, oh my god, how does he know this? And I know this. <laughs> well, I mean, I know just you're... found out that day. <laughs> I was fresh. Well, I fresh was... knowledge. Oh well, I mean, yeah, I was. Well, I was impressed because I was like, wow, <laughs> Kaz cuts deep. Like he just knows his his cinephile brain is like robust thank oh, you God, you have no Please. idea yeah. <laughs> yes. well i'm looking beside me in all these film books and you know like it's good it's yes good. nothing but nothing but film books and like three novels that i <laughs> that i haven't read you just put up on the bookshelf to fill up some empty space so people think you're well read yes including a copy of atlas shrugged that i bought because you mentioned we should do that trilogy of movies yeah and i got about like 20 pages into Atlas Shrugged, I'm like, nope, not reading this. Yeah, and I was like, <laughs> why don't we just make fun of the movie? You don't have to do a whole lot of research on Atlas Shrugged. I would rather you didn't do a whole lot of research on Atlas Shrugged. Hey, like Stephanie says, I cut deep. Yeah. Uh, but you mentioned Rosemary's Baby is is your favorite movie, not just your favorite horror movie, but favorite movie, top. So uh, let's 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 speak on that. When when was when was the first time you watched Rosemary's Baby? Do you remember the effect that it had on you? Sure. Yeah. Um, Sounds like a lie. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, this is going to be not a lie. It's an educated guess. Mm. I think the first time I saw it was in university. I I mean, I'll go I'll go a little bit further back. Um, when I was a teenager, like many people who go into the arts, I was just obsessed with storytelling and films and movies. So, um, you know, when I was, I think about 12, 13, I got into this rhythm where every Friday night I would walk to the video flicks by my house and I would rent two horror movies and I would watch one on Friday and one on Saturday by myself. Yeah, I was... Not the coolest kid. No, I'm sorry. I, I asked you for, for your childhood story, not mine. All right? Because you're literally speaking my language yeah. here. You're, I literally walked to the video store to get to rent my movies on my own. I yeah, mean, that's crazy. the poor children nowadays don't have that. They don't have the whole blockbuster experience. I know. I'm, I swear I'm not trying to plug my show, but that's this is this is the thing, right? Yeah. Anyway, anyway, okay. Um, so Rosemary's Baby. So I don't think I saw Rosemary's Baby in that streak of time. That streak of time was like, I did all the Friday the 13th. I did all the Halloweens. Mm. I did every Stephen King movie I could get my hands on. Um, that's the age to do it. at. That was the age, yeah. right? Like I was, I, my brain, oh my God, to have the kind of like, uh, porous brain that we did back then. Right. Suggestible to Instead everything. Instead of the and... cement block in my head. Now. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Young I, and impressionable before you realize Stephen King's kind of a bit of an oh, odd duck. <laughs> is he? Uh, he's an canceled? odd duck. What happened? What no. happened to Stephen King? Uh, he's just a, I think he's just a bit of a hack. Myself, oh, he's but, a hack. How is he a hack? Is it because he does one thing, but he does it really well? Yeah. <laughs> Look, I'll, I'll, all I'll say is last... Great, great premise, great short story writer. It doesn't have to end with a giant spider. That's Look, all I'm, I'm going to... Uh, <laughs> are you talking about <laughs> one book? No, but I'll tell you, my favorite Stephen... We're going really off topic yeah. here, but I feel like... We never okay. do that here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
I my favorite Stephen King book is The Long Mile. I think is it's called, and it is the the conceit of that book is that um, every year in the United States of America, one every state chooses one youth to go and compete in this. It's very um, Hunger Games, mm, yes, but say. far before the Hunger Games, mm. but it takes place in our like present life. Sends one 16 year old boy, specifically mm. a boy, um, to compete in this thing called the Longest Mile, and they have to. It's just this big parade of boys who move, and they can't go under, I think it's four kilometers per hour or something like that. Like, they can't slow down. I believe it's the long walk. The long walk. Thank you. Yes, the long walk. I got the Green Mile yes. and the Long Walk. That, that, those, were two, those were the two things that mm-hmm. pop up. I'm yes. sure that's coming out. It's at all some about point hybrid films, yeah. <laughs> um, but I loved that book because it was so simple. There were no mm-hmm. spiders, you know, because <laughs> he can get a little bit. Um, I don't know. What's Coked the opposite up. of flowery? <laughs> what's the opposite of flowery? Like the horror version of flowery. It's just like a little bit much. Oh, um, the opposite. I would say a little rudimentary. Oh, pedestrian. Yeah. I'm trying to think yeah. about the opposite of a flower is a rock. Cement. Uh, <laughs> but those, sorry, I'm, I'm dirt, sorry I brought dirt. up. Dirt? <laughs> First off, I'm sorry that I suggested Stephen King is a hack knowing who I am and the bullshit that I've written. So, <laughs> <laughs> But I think, that the, I think the reason why The Long Walk spoke to me so much is I like my horror to feel possible. Mm, I sure, like yeah. it to feel really grounded. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, again... Uh, bringing it up to Rosemary's Baby was part of the... Okay, so I think I first saw Rosemary's Baby in university. Right. Um, I got a film minor when I went to university, and I went to a small liberal arts university in Quebec, and it was, like, such a... We had so many weirdo, amazing, brilliant professors who were just... So it just sort of felt like they were just left to do what they wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Like, I did a film course called The Films of Marlon Brando. I did... Uh, like just so many like odd ball courses that were just like I feel like they cooked it up in an afternoon but um I really got into 70s cinema there because seven like the 70s cinema just had something there was like such a oh, yeah. this feeling of exploration and mm. this breaking of the form that was happening then it was so exciting it was the era of like the film brats like yes. Coppola and Friedkin and Spielberg yeah, and but and also Lucas art house and... also yes, Europe yeah. was really yeah, yeah. making its mm-hmm. mark Argento and... that kind of stuff yeah yeah you know mm-hmm. like I like blow up is one of my yeah the, uh, yeah I was about to films. say yeah, Antonini and the, the the Italian masters and, and exactly. uh, Fellini to, to to a certain degree even though he started earlier yeah but, yeah yeah. Uh, yeah I mean there's like there's <clears> so, <throat> such exciting <clears throat> stuff coming out of the seventies and you watch uh, certain movies from the seventies and, and it, they just go in uh, weird, unconventional directions that you don't expect a movie to. And then the movie ends and you're just like, I didn't realize a movie could end that way. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, with, with felt... nothing resolved yeah, so yeah. and more and more questions raised than answered. <clears throat> well, it, exactly. Right. Like I feel like the seventies were a time that there, the formulas hadn't taken hold yet. Like all of now the conventional studio storytelling Mm -hmm. that it almost feels like you have to figure out a way to fit into those boxes to be able to make a film. To resolve it in a happy ending kind of way. Uh, Well, you know, but also like dark endings are having a time too. You know, it's, 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 it's more like the, like the beat sheet kind of thing. And like all of these things hadn't been cemented for us yet. So there was just so much exciting, experimentation with the forms of storytelling. So, and for me, Rosemary's Baby was a great example of that because it feels like an art house film to me. Yeah. You know, and it has that really sort of controlled, slow um, thing that a lot of art house films from uh, used to have, but also it's a really great plot based Mm -hmm. film. So it's like this perfect meeting of the time. And I remember when I watched it, I was just that feeling of dread that Polanski was able to create with like this isolated apartment and just that sense of like in inside outside that he was able to do with Rosemary and like mm-hmm. everything about the gestation and mm-hmm. there's just so many elements that made the film affecting and compelling, especially as a woman watching it, that I 
I think, unfortunately, they really lost in the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> you mean how I'm Rosemary was, like, written out of the movie yeah. in the first ten minutes? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I had never seen Rosemary's Baby. We watched it together, Kaz and I. Uh, which which was a nice down. treat for us watching a good a, a, movie? an actual good movie. Yeah. For oh, a change. Yeah. Like yeah. an actual Stone Cold classic. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> but, like, a, psycho horror, a psychological horror movie like that uh, was, was pretty much just what I needed, and I had always had, like, the specter of Rosemary's Baby as this quintessential must-see horror classic. I really didn't know what I was getting into. I knew there was like like a Satanism, a Satanic cult element to it. But to me, like the premise of you are the center of a conspiracy that everyone you know is in on against you, that's terrifying. Yeah. And like the Satanic supernatural elements on it are all happening off camera. So yeah. it is a very grounded experience like that. And I'm sure you know, like as you're saying, like for, like for a woman, that would be terrifying to have like such a vulnerable time in your life, and your neighbors are, are conspiring against you. Your your fiance is conspiring against you. Your doctor are conspiring well, against you. Well, yeah. I mean, let's make some parallels to our present time here, shall mm. we? Mm, you know, course, yeah. the idea of forced gestation mm -hmm. is. Not, I don't know if this is a political podcast, but it just got political. You know, like it's, you <laughs> we're know, talking I, about a Polanski movie. <laughs> yeah, we, have to, we have to get like a little political here. Yeah, obviously, yeah, yeah. there's a few just discussions we have to have. Uh, I don't think there's anything political about what Polanski did. He's a fucking asshole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's an asshole. Hot take. Yeah. Hot take. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, I think that being a young woman watching that uh, probably planted some subconscious seeds that then, again, with Roe versus Wade, uh, you know, just exploded in my brain because mm -hmm. it, that idea of there's something growing inside of you mm -hmm. and you, there's nothing you can do about it yeah. and you do, and, and it's unwelcome mm -hmm. and, you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely yeah. horrifying. And, and you know there's something wrong with you and people are gaslighting yeah. you. And, that's the, and yeah. that's the scariest yeah. thing about this most recent watch of Rosemary's Baby for me because I had seen it before. Obviously, I'm coming from it from a different perspective now, but I think the most interesting thing about watching the movie today is that it's a very terrifying movie, but it's the, a lot of the terror comes from the fact that it's a story about a woman who is constantly saying there's something wrong with my body and no one will believe her and no one will listen to yeah. her. And it's wild that it uh, came... I mean, obviously, it was based on a book by Ira Levin who had, uh, you know, his opinions as well. Uh, but uh, Roman Polanski himself also wrote the screenplay, so it's really interesting that it's coming from the perspective... It reads as such a modern-day feminist text, but it comes from the mind of someone who... Um, apart from the the horrible crime that he committed, uh, is also a flagrant misogynist as well. Mm. So it's really interesting how it sort of accidentally uh, becomes like this feminist text uh, nowadays. Yeah. yeah, it is interesting, but at the same time, I also find it, and again, now we're going to get into the territory of can we separate the art from the artist, because while we're watching Rosemary go through this really oppressive experience and exploitive experience at the same time, we're so connected to her, to Mia Farrow. We're so, right. like, as an audience, you're we're brought into such relationship with her body, and you know the fact that she's so thin, mm -hmm. and that she keeps herself that way very purposefully, mm -hmm. um, and that this pregnancy sort of is giving her this excuse to try and be better to herself, and yet everybody's actually trying to hurt her through it. There's like, there's interesting, yeah, like there are feminist tones mm. to it. Yeah. You know, there, there, are, there is a way to read the film that you see that this is, you know, this is Rosemary's sort of hero journey. Yeah. Especially because at the end of the movie, she does not reject her baby. Yeah. Which is like, right. oh, there's just so much to unpack Yeah, that, that's the that's the bleak ending that the horror movie wants to dovetail towards. That's like, okay, well... Right, yeah. Well, now the maternal instincts are kicking in, and she's, well, if someone's going to raise this kid to be the spawn of Satan, I guess it's got to be his own mother, because yeah. someone's going to look up for this kid. It's, it's just such me. an interesting movie to watch nowadays, because... Uh, people's views on Satanism have also changed significantly. Yeah. We've embraced it a lot more. We have, and yeah. like most yeah. modern day Satanists are like good d uh, people who like have like sound morals and stuff, and and basically, are uh, I know very little about this, but you're being serious right now. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, like a lot Do of we still have Satanists. Oh yeah, very much so. They're, yes, they're, they're, more, they're, they're more. They're not like <laughs> devil worshippers per se. They're more or less just like uh, I. We're just agnostic, and we're gonna get our morals. I mean, it's agnostic like, with, with with like a hint of like 
just sort of embracing chaos, you know, and sort of yeah. being like anti-establishment. Right. And our values are going to come from yeah. like the social construct that we're finding ourselves in now, which is if you look at like the the commandments of Satanism, it's mostly just mind your own business. You know, right. you know, like treat everyone with respect. Basically, if you if you look Don't... at like a fundamentalist Republican Christian, <laughs> modern day Satanism is like the opposite yeah. of what those people <laughs> believe. Yeah. I mean, that's my that's kind of why I have some skepticism there because I feel like if you're gonna choose to call yourself a Satanist, it's a little clickbaity, don't we think? Like. So just to attach Dep the word Satan. Depends on what it. crowds I suppose you, 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 you roll yeah. in. Uh, but at this point, it's just. It's like, know, I don't believe I don't want to judge anybody. But I don't believe in nothing, uh, yeah. Steph. I believe in Satan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It, I don't, it's, it's, a we, it's a rejection of any kind of higher power, like any kind of all knowing God figure that you need to right. devote your life to. Yeah. Well, it's it's sort of just a rejection of that. Yeah. yeah. Which, which you know, agnostic, you know, it's sort of fall, or like nihilism, you know, a little bit mm. under those purview. I feel if you're calling yourself a satanist you probably just don't like your parents very much it's like what's, what's really happening there you're like mom okay yeah. i'm gonna be a satanist we, like, we, we have a huge that's my impression we have a huge church of satan listening i was gonna yeah. say uh, so uh, yeah. just like a whole demographic the, the, pod, the podcast does not reflect the thoughts of our guy. no no it's fine no yeah. but it, it's it's interesting watching this movie now because you come into it, it's all like okay so it's like a uh you know like oh satanist so like devil worship and everything like that that's where this horror movie's coming from yeah and you go and like nowadays you know it's a bunch of like uh, people in their 70s like old grandmas stand around chanting hail satan it, yes. it's a little goofy yeah. nowadays goofy. but the the horror is still present in in the movie rosemary's baby but it, it, it comes from like the mundane aspects of the society that rosemary has to live in i mean the most mm. horrifying aspect of that movie is uh, the fact that she it isn't the scene where she's hallucinating and Satan himself shows up and manifests and I could have uh, done without those dream sequences. Forces, I'll tell you that much. forces himself on her. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, like that's that's horrifying. What's even more horrifying is uh, the next day she wakes up and her husband just casually mentions, "Oh yeah, I just had sex with you while you were out." Oh mm -hmm. my god! And that's like, and and she's just kind of all like, "What?" And it's like it's even more horrifying. Uh, when you consider the fact that uh, marital rape was like legal in New York until like 1984 mm -hmm. or something, or so I, I'm getting that year wrong, but yeah. like something insane like that, and it's all like that's the 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 horrifying part of that movie. It's not it's not yeah. like this goofy Satan stuff anymore, and yeah. that I, I I don't even know if that necessarily was like at the forefront of anyone's mind while they were making the movie. Uh, I was in just going to say that, yeah. Like, I wonder if that hit the same way. Yeah. Well, I think in the, in the 70s, people weren't as secular as they are now. There was a whole lot more pearl clutching at the time. So the idea that your neighbor could be a Satanist that's where, like, the fear of the occult or whatever came from. Was this from. the time of the satanic panic? I, I really knew that as more of, like, an 80s yeah, thing. Yeah, that's what I thought. But, it, it, I mean, it's been I, pervasive I it since, like, the 50s, where it's like, that, the rock and roll is the devil's music. Marijuana is the right. devil's dandruff think, or whatever. I think it had little pockets. I think it really hit its apex in the 80s with the whole, uh, what is it, the West Memphis f 3 and everything, and mm. that really kind of got... Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it has, you know, but, like, Rosemary's Baby's still, what, 1976? 1968, 1968, actually. Oh. Not, not even a 70s movie kind of a 70s movie kind of around right the precipice of a 70s not as much as look what's happened to rosemary's baby yes that's a very 70s movie yes are we headed out of the mccarthy era then because there oh, is i'm not sure you know there's a I, there's a <sighs> little bit of that six. feeling of that post-war feeling of yeah. like oh there are people spe literally speaking through uh, through the walls you know like yeah. to me that's one of the mm -hmm. most terrifying aspects of the film is she can hear right. These little things happening in the apartments around her and she has no control over it and it just makes her world feel that much smaller and more controlled and mm -hmm. I mean we're sort of touching on this now but you know no conversation about Rosemary's baby is complete without talking about sort of like the after effects of what happens with Rosemary's baby of course famously the year after it comes out Robin Polanski's wife Sharon Tate is murdered by the Manson family mm -hmm. uh, and uh, of course like uh, I think like maybe like a decade after that uh, John Lennon is staying in the building that the movie is shot at when he's, sh he's shot by uh, uh, that Mark, Mark David Chapman and everything. Um, I didn't there, know that. There's like, mm. yeah, it's the same building. Yeah. Uh, there's like other. It's a very like, famous building. It is, yeah. yeah. Uh, they're, they're, very, very famous coincidence. And a lot of. Yeah. The, I think a lot of people will equate the two things as being like, oh, this is more proof than ever that Satan is alive and well and, 
and, and corrupting <laughs> and there, the world. And it's like, you know, no, it's a massive fucking coincidence. And there's just, you know, I wouldn't call it like a curse or anything like mm-hmm. that, but there's just, you you have to like consider like other things as well too, just kind of like the the, the casual tragedy that uh, uh, Mia Farrow has had in her life. I mean, while she was filming this movie, uh, she was married to Frank Sinatra and Frank Sinatra wanted her to walk off the set because he demanded that she was going to act in a movie that he did. And when she said, no, I need to finish the movie I'm in, he divorced her. Uh, and then and then everything worked out for her fine because she immediately uh, started a, a new relationship with a guy that everyone loves and there's no problems with. Uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah, there's like lots of like weird little like minutia things uh, and everything. And then like... Um, God, how much of a conversation do we want to have about Robin Polanski? I mean, not <laughs> we, don't, we don't have to have like a ton, like a like a huge one. But yeah, like, we don't have to have much. You know, like art artists, artists, guys, artists are, are crazy people. Stay away from their trouble. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Any well, creative like, type. Like I was just in Los Angeles and we went to the Chateau Marmont just to have a drink, and you know, while we were there, we were obviously googling the Chateau Marmont, and like everything has happened there deaths, overdoses, like so much drama. Just, yeah, I think anytime you get a whole bunch of creative people together, it's going to be chaos. And drugs. You know, and <laughs> drugs. And then like add a couple decades onto there and like mm. alcohol and parties and, you know, like it's just, it's it's a bit chaos. Uh, Roman Polanski, I mean, fuck. I'm sorry, is, is that okay? I, oh, I the, show, you, the show used to be called The Fuck Is This. So oh, yeah, don't worry okay. about it. Yes, that okay. is. <laughs> We're, I mean, as long as it's not in the first minute, we're fine. We're a po- we're a political foul mouth podcast, is what we do here. Potty right? mouth podcast. It's, yes. You know, this film has been the toughest one for me when we talk about separating art from artist. I don't give a crap about uh, any of Michael Jackson's music. I I I hate Michael. Like, I'm like I'm like I can throw out the art and the artist. Yeah, there. fuck that guy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. But with yeah. this film, I'm like, oh man, like I'm always gonna love this movie. Mm. We just watched The Ninth Gate. A couple of weeks ago as right. well, which was also I was dismayed. I, I have like five minutes into the film. That's like, a twofer because that's a Johnny Depp Roman Polanski, so that's oh. that's like twice as hard to watch. Oh, well, I love Depp. Okay, yeah, we don't need to Sorry. get into this. We don't have to yeah. get into he's, it. He's canceled to a different degree than Roman Polanski. Johnny Depp, to the best of our recollection, is not you know had sex with a child. So that's well, you know what? He gets a gold star for that. Yeah. Don't 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 sex children. So there you, you go, Johnny. Are you Team Amber? I don't... You know what? I think they're two terrible people that were terrible to each other and uh, probably made each other miserable. And as a culture... I think there's mental health As a culture, we've there, probably yeah. uh, paid too much attention to it. But I do think that the, the power dynamic is a little skewed there uh, in, in his favor. And I think that's kind of unfair. I don't think Amber Heard is a great person, but I think the fallout... Um, is going to have unfortunate effects uh, to to all women who come forward and say that this this guy has been abusing me. Yeah. Uh, oh, the fallout. There's no mistaking the fallout. But yeah. Anyway, I, I don't know. I don't know. We don't have to talk about this. But sure. like, I was. I was two one things of those can people. two things can be true. I mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Like I was one of those people who was extremely obsessed with the trial, and it just happened. Like it was on when I was filming, so I right. was either on set or I was hard to get away from with it. a bunch of actors yeah. talking about it. You know, or I was at home literally watching like the YouTube roundup with yeah. a bunch of lawyers. Mm-hmm. So I was pretty obsessed with it. And I, in my takeaway is that I, I would like to not cancel Johnny Depp because I don't think that he deserves it. But I think he'll be back. I think he'll be fine. I oh, think he's already him, back. Oh, give it a couple miss, years. Guys, he'll... he didn't miss a beat. He's he didn't miss a beat. He went right back out on tour, <laughs> yeah. and he's and I'm like, live your life. Boy. That fucking what, what was that movie he did? The where he was like the the photographer or whatever. That one, like the audience oh, no. award of the Oscars or whatever. I don't know. Oh, really? the, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, it's all okay, dumb. Ninth yeah. Gate. It's all dumb. Yeah. Ninth Gate, also yeah. Polanski. Yeah. Five minutes into it, I'm like, oh, this feels like Rosemary's Baby. And of course, I look it up and it's Polanski. And it's, um, so yeah, but just going back to the art and the artist thing, it's, it's, it's a real tough one. It's a real tough one. I always just go back to. I have to separate the art from the artist, otherwise I'll never be able to enjoy anything that that anybody puts out. There's a whole lot of whack jobs out there. It's just really hard. I it, it's less about like um, denying yourself the art that already exists because there's problematic people out there. It's it's more hard now to, um, I guess like 
have heroes or idols within like the, oh, yeah. the art and entertainment industry because mm-hmm. you're always kind of like worried on a certain level as all like well what have they done mm-hmm. and then like it, it seems like every month uh some new sort of like horrible story about someone misbehaving mm-hmm. uh mm-hmm. comes out and you have to like now now's all like great now i have to like uh gauge uh, this new story that i've heard based on my love of Ghostbusters or, or, or whatever, you know, and it, it's, it's, yeah, it's just like a difficult climate, uh, to, uh, really throw yourself fully into, uh, the enjoyment of, of something, but it, it's difficult discussions that we all have to have as consumers. And, uh, you know, I would, I'm, it's important that we have them and I'm not saying that having them, is worse or better than just like enjoying things guilt free. You know, like you should have these type of conversations. It just gets a little frustrating sometimes. I'll say this about Roman Polanski. He made a better movie than Look What's Happened. <laughs> Look what's Rose happened in Rose he made the Rose better Rosemary's, Rosemary's Baby, Baby movie. <laughs> yes. Well, and also, you know, yeah, I think that there will be people who's unfortunately like I won't be able to enjoy their stuff anymore because of what they've done. Um, but yeah, there's also something to be said about the fact that like people go through different seasons in their life. I'm like, I don't know if maybe if Roman Polanski was, you know, like being a predator while he was making the film, maybe I would feel a little bit differently. But people do terrible things at different stages and it doesn't we shouldn't allow it to negate the fact that they've also made things to like share with the world. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I don't know. It's more of the issue that... Someday, I'm sure I'll be canceled because everybody will find out <laughs> how... keep, keep, keep your nose clean. We'll That's all be canceled because of this episode of this yeah, podcast. Exactly. Yes, yeah. because of the views that we share. It's 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 such a weird, fucked up thing about Polanski. It is like, obviously, the act that he did is horrifying, but people are more mad at the fact that he accepted no responsibility for the fact that he, he hopped on a plane and oh. he, and he still like a couple of years ago, he won like the Cesar for best film, which was a film about a man uh, who was uh, wrongfully accused of a crime. Mm. And that's it. We're le- we're letting that happen. And it's kind of like, maybe we shouldn't let that specifically that happen. Mm. Yeah. Maybe we shouldn't let him specifically direct that movie and give him awards for that movie. Well, but, you know. I mean, we're still letting Woody Allen make films for some reason, you yeah. know, and like big stars that I really respect, love working with him. And it's, it's all really tough because I, I don't know. I'm an well. I was gonna say if he called me up, what I'd do. No, I probably wouldn't actually. You don't need. You don't need that kind of. Press I don't need stuff. really. <laughs> no, you really don't. No. I've got this. Exactly. That's right, yeah. I've got this one. <laughs> That's, all That's all I need. You know, you've made it when you're a guest on Nothing Movies. Yeah. <laughs> um. All right, cool. Well, uh, that seems we're, like a... We're closing dude. the book. We're closing, uh, we're closing the book. We're closing the book on cancel culture. We're closing the book on all of we these... We solved the world's problems. Hot button topics. All right, well, uh, yeah, why don't we take a little break, and when we come back, we'll dive right into... Look, look what's, look what's now. Look what's happening now. <laughs> look, look Rosemary's happening baby now. is over there and look at it. Look, look at him go. Look at, <laughs> look at Ro- what happened to Rosemary's baby. Look, look at this baby. Marvel at the 70s disco <laughs> rock. <laughs> Thrill at the sight of, yeah. That's what it seems you gotta like. You got to cut a new trailer It's like a thing. 50s sci-fi movie. <laughs> All right, we'll be right back. Water. We need it to live. That's an unavoidable fact. It makes up the majority of us. Up to 60% of you is water. Yes, you, the person listening to this. And yet, the one element that binds us together as a species isn't readily available to most of the population of this planet. It's estimated that 1.1 billion people lack access to fresh drinking water, and more than that have to settle for water that's loaded with diseases such as cholera and typhoid fever. By 2025, It's likely that two-thirds of the Earth's population will be affected by water shortages. It seems bleak, of course, but there are people out there trying to make a difference. So if you can spare some money, please consider donating to this week's charities, the International Development and Relief Foundation, and Water for People. The IDRF has branches for multiple disasters and humanitarian efforts, but their Water Sanitation and Hygiene Program, or WASH, provides safe drinking water, Sanitation facilities like bathrooms and hand wash stations, and education and proper hygiene for people of all ages. Water for People works across nine countries in Latin America, Asia, and Africa to address the global water crisis and equip communities with lasting access to fresh water and sanitation services. To donate to these charities, 
please visit the links in our show description. Or visit idrf.ca and waterforpeople.org. Fantastic. Yeah, we're back. <laughs> no, no, no. I'll do that better. No, no. Let's just keep it in. Come on, man. We're almost at the end of Halloween. Let's just... uh, we're back. Yeah. yeah this is look what's happened to Rosemary's Week. We don't have to give it that much fanfare. Sure. So look what's happened. I have to think about it. Mm-hmm. I, have, I can't just yeah. say the so, title. So look. What's happened to Rosemary's Week? <laughs> That's the intonation they're looking for. Look. What's happened to Rosemary's Baby? I'll tell you. I mean, I love that interpretation so yeah. much more than what it actually is because mm. it's like so sarcastic. It's just like, God. I mean, it's true. You watch the movie and you what just kind of all like, well, what happened he's to Rosemary's Baby? He's become the most baby. self-indulgent, melodramatic <laughs> yeah. little bitch. Well, he's, is what's oh, happened. He's part Satan. That's the darkness in him. It just makes him so broody. He's like, a moody 35-year-old oh masquerading as a 28-year-old. <laughs> Yeah, this okay, look, we're gonna get into the whole thing, but I, I need to talk about like the timeline of this movie because it doesn't make any sense. But anyway, mm. uh, a little bit of backstory here. Uh, look what's happened to Rosemary's baby was directed by the editor of Rosemary's Baby, right. Sam Osteen, uh, who worked with Polanski on two more films, but primarily edited the films of Mike Nichols. Uh, He was nominated for the Oscar for Best Editing three times for Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, Chinatown, and Silkwood. And his career includes Cool Hand Luke, The Graduate, Working Girl, Catch-22, Frantic regarding Henry, and Wolf. What so, the fuck? So, like an amateur, like he did yeah, 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 just some guy, doing. just yeah. some hack. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Uh, as a director, he primarily directed TV movies with titles like "The Best Little Girl in the World," mm. "Queen of the Stardust Ballroom," and my personal favorite, "I Love You." Dot dot dot. Goodbye. His one theatrical film was 1976's "Sparkle." which is about a girl group which is loosely based on Diana Ross and the Supremes that came out a full five years before Dreamgirls, the more popular thing that's based on Diana Ross and the Supremes, uh, which was the screenwriting debut of Joel Schumacher. Whoa. And was Whitney Houston's favorite movie, which she later produced a remake of, which became her final film role. What? Yeah. Huh. So a whole bunch of All facts. random facts there wow. for you. Yeah. Coming out of the woodwork. What a legacy. I mean, but also, who is this guy? Like, he doesn't seem to have a... That's the theatrical film he makes? I'm so boggled by that, because I was mm. thinking, with that legacy of everything else that he's been involved in, I'm like, oh, surely we're going to have some kind of, like, semi-Oscar contending drama. Yeah, he would have some bigger some opportunities action. come his way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very male-driven, but... I mean, there are, there isn't a ton... Uh, I'm sure there's, like, one, one big example that I'm forgetting of that I'll remember after this recording is over. But, like, there's not, like, a ton of, like well-known name directors who started off in different avenues of the filmmaking process. There's not a ton Mm -hmm. of, like, people who started off as editors that later turned that into a directing career. I can think of, like, a couple of, like, cinematographer-turned-directors. The the most famous one is, like, Barry Sonnenfeld, who started off shooting the Coen Brothers movies and and then became, like, the director of The Addams Family and everything. Um, I'm sure there is, like, one... Famous editor turned director that I that I'm going to be kicking myself for for not mentioning, but I mean it's interesting. I mean like this guy had one career where he was you know Oscar nominated, didn't need like he reached like the highest level of like accolades you could as a film editor, yeah. and then I guess was just just like I want to make the movies myself, and all all he could turn out was a bunch of TV movies no one remembers, and then one interesting uh, uh, little independent. Um, uh, film uh, uh, about like black culture from 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 a white filmmaker. So it's interesting that yeah that that is the avenue that he went down. Hollywood, everyone. Yeah, <laughs> well, wild stories. You know, I think that. And it, it's funny that you make that you say that. I it, and that surprises me that more editors did not become directors because I'm people, looking it up right now because I'm sure there's one. The that people I've that I know in my life now who are editors slash directors like it's it's very very common like the skill set mm. overlaps a lot you know like oh, you absolutely. have to be able to 
to, you know, one of the biggest skills as a director is to be able to edit in your mind as you go. And not all directors can do that. A lot of directors are just purely like performance based creative directors mm -hmm. and don't really have much of an interest in that technical side but the, boy like, does it help if you do <laughs> it's like you, you are an actor's director so you can get the most out of the yeah. performance but then there are some directors that more of it have more of an eye for cinematography okay. i'm like i don't know i don't like the term actor's director because mm. i see a lot of i see a lot of directors grab onto that and say as i'm an actor's director and to me Oh, it's going to come off so bitchy. Please. It feels a little bit like a cop-out. Like, mm. oh, I'm not going to concern myself with learning any of the technical stuff because, I, you know, I'm an actor's director. Mm. Because quite frankly, as an actor who's becoming a director, that's the easiest part is working with the actors. Like, it's, it's also, well, it was the most fun at first. Now I love all the technical stuff. But right. to learn all the technical stuff is very intimidating. So I actually think... Here's a less bitchy way of saying it. I, th I actually think it's very comforting for new directors who are coming from acting to say I'm an actor's director mm. because they feel like that's something that they can do well. Um, and so maybe it comes from insecurity. Anyway, that's my rant. Right. That's my rant. Uh, yeah, so I just I just typed in 12 film editors who became uh, directors. Not I, I found an article that says 12 film editors who became directors. Yeah, there's a couple of the ones here that, that uh, I forgot about. Like uh, Robert Wise started off as an editor. He edited Citizen Kane, and then he went on to direct West Side Story and The Sound of Music. The big one that I that obviously that I was referring to earlier that uh, of course uh, this is a uh, famous editor turned director uh, is Hal Ashby who direct who won an Oscar for editing In the Heat of the Night and then he went on to have like his own like acclaimed film career with uh, Coming Home and uh, Harold and Maude uh, which starred uh, Ruth Gordon uh, oh. to 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 turn this back onto this. Speaking of Oscars. Um, this, this, uh, 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 70s TV movie, uh, sequel, uh, has four Oscar-winning actors <laughs> in it, including Ruth Gordon, who won an Oscar for playing this role. It, it's in, so in, odd to in, see her in, back in, the, in, in the this. original Rosemary's in, Baby. In the original not for Rose... this TV movie. No, not for this TV yeah. movie, no. yes. For yeah. this role! Yeah. Oh, you're reprising this role. Reprising. Oh, yeah. and like, what a sport. Like, yeah. What a sport for coming back and being like, yeah, I love this role. I'll play this role. Oh my god! Like, how much would you kill to be able to do that? I mean, I would have to imagine it's a fun role. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I wonder if they looked at anyone else who is maybe cheaper, uh, and they were like, I can't do that accent. <laughs> <laughs> I told Sydney it's a stupid gift. We'll tell you anything you want to know. You're entitled. But first, the toast for a birthday boy. Ah, will you lay off all this killer talk? We only got a couple more days out here. There's something blocking. I can't get it. And then the smell of dying. The decades before Harley Quinn made the scene, so... Yeah, to, me, to me, it just feels like, oh, the, uh, like I feel like that makes her such an artist. Like, it makes me fall in love with her. Mm -hmm. The fact that she was like, no, that's my role. I'm going to do the role again. You what know, are you again. talking about? Of course I'm going to do that role. I have to imagine she was offered it, and she probably said to herself, I'm like, well, if I don't do it, someone else will. I might as well get the paycheck. I might yeah, as well yeah, get yeah, the yeah, money. Yeah. I won an Oscar for this role. I'm going to go and do it again, because no one's taking this role away from me. I'm Ruth fucking Gordon, for God's sakes. <laughs> I wrote Adam's Rib with Tracy and Hepburn. People are gonna people are gonna Should remember we just this. Just do the rest of the podcast as, as, as <laughs> that's not gonna get great no. in at all. People no. are gonna want to listen to that. Yeah, but yeah, Ruth Gordon is back. Um, uh, she's the only returning cast member from from the the movie. Uh, most of the characters from the movie are here. They are present. Mm. Uh, Rosemary this time uh, is uh, played by uh, Patty, Patty Duke. Patty Duke mm. uh, here credited as uh, Patty Duke Aston because this is. Uh, the period where she was uh, married to John Aston, but of course Patty Duke uh, won her Oscar for playing Helen Keller in The Miracle Worker. Mm -hmm. uh, the actor who played uh, Roman, uh, Roman uh, Castavet, uh, it's really interesting. I, you know what? I just realized the villain of this story is named Roman. 
<laughs> like Roman Polanski. Mm-hmm. That's so funny how I just thought of that. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the actor who played Roman in the, the movie uh, passed away uh, in between uh, these movies. So he's played in this movie by Ray Milland, who won an Oscar in uh, 1945 uh, for The Lost Weekend. Uh, and then super randomly, in in a role that uh, I'm, I'm sure is like the highlight for, for everyone here, uh, Broderick Crawford who won Best Actor in 1949 for All the King's Men, uh, plays Sheriff Holtzman. Mm. And if you don't remember what character that is, it's... it's he's, the, he's the sheriff. He's the sheriff, and he has, like, one line. <laughs> he literally has one line. It's all like, hey, Rosemary's baby, don't you drag race no more. All right, well, goodbye. I'm out of this movie now, and he never comes back. <laughs> and for some reason, they got an, they could have gotten any actor to play that role. Mm. They could have gotten, like a, like, a boom mic operator to play that role. But no, let's get a literal Oscar winner TV, to play this role. TV movies were all the rage back then, I, I guess. I like to think when things like that happened, though, it was probably become, because Roderick and the director were up, like, doing coke all night, and mm. he was like, hey, I'm going to film this scene tomorrow. You want to just, wouldn't it be funny if you came in and just played the cop, you know? Because that was the set. That was the 70s. Yeah, he That's was, how things happened, right? That's how casting made, was He made. was probably, like, across the street filming another movie, and during a yeah, lunch yeah, break, yeah, he's yeah. like, hey, put on this cop uniform. We'll yeah. get you in for a walk-on. Like, yeah. sure, why not? Yeah. yeah. That happened in the, the, the golden era of those, like, 60s and 70s cartoons you would get guys who were like just laying down tracks for like say like like a rat pack album and then right next door they were filming fucking Roger Ramjet or whatever or Yogi Bear is like hey do you want to play like a park ranger or like a teacher oh. yeah sure why not ring a ding ding baby <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean god it was just the wild west back then wasn't mm. it I d- yeah, I mean, I do. I feel like every generation has this feeling, but I feel like we missed out on the better times. There was a little more freewheeling there in the was 70s. So much, there was, yeah, my there was my a lot parents of like, keep going on about how much things were so much better <laughs> I, back I, then, and, and they're right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's a it's a you know it's a win and lose kind of thing because it was also not a great time for a lot of reasons, but right. uh, yeah. a lot more partying. Mm-hmm. Which had its ups and downs. So do we want to go through um, what happens in this movie and try to parse out sure. the plot? Because I'm pretty clueless as to what happens here. All right. Well, what, what happens to Rosemary's Baby? Well, uh, well first off, I'll just, not much. I'll, first of all, just say like as a sequel, it kind of feels like you don't need to have seen Rosemary's Baby to grasp what's going on in Look What's Happened to Rosemary's Baby. That's true. Yeah. Very like that. they're very different movies. For yeah. for one, there's way more of a supernatural element to this movie. The Satanists in the first one, all of their occulty uh, cursing kind of stuff happens off camera and it's mentioned in passing or just like events that happen in the movie that are the result of a curse right. are relayed back to Rosemary. And th- this one, they can control the weather or whatever. They've sort of <laughs> shot themselves in the foot doing a sequel to this because the the, the thing about Rosemary's Baby is that it, it's, like a, it's like a mystery. It's mm. almost like a twist at the end because it's the entire movie you're all like, is there something sinister going on with these people or is it all in Rosemary's head and then the twist of the end of the movie is all like no they were evil the entire time yeah. when you're well they kind of tip their hand yeah. earlier when they say hey there's this building used to have a problem with witchcraft or whatever yeah. and they're like oh they tell us that early and so when all this creepy shenanigans keep going on in the building is no, I already know. There's probably some witchcraft shit going yeah. on here. Yeah. So like the the cat's out of the bag for the sequel, and mm-hmm. so it, it's a, like you you can you can only go so far mm-hmm. now that we know uh, yeah. you know how the sausage is made uh, to 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 yeah. uh, use that saying. So I talk good. <laughs> so, so the movie opens with um, let's just say like seven or eight years have passed since Rosemary had her demonic baby. Uh, Rosemary is raising it, and at this uh, exact moment. She decides that she's going to uh, take her young child, Andrew slash Adrian, depending, you know, who's the Satanists, talking to him. The Satanists call him Adrian. She insists that his name is Andrew. Mm-hmm. It feels like after, like, six or seven years of having this kid, they might have come to an agreement. Yeah. Uh, but they are, uh, they, they, yeah. they are they are at odds the entire time. You get the, <laughs> you get the idea that, like, Rosemary has been raising the kid in tandem with, like, the, the group of Satanists. Well, his bedroom slash playroom, which is just adorned with all these, like, devil puppets and, like, a swastika flag. They, he has <laughs> so many, he has so much Nazi imagery, which is so confusing. That was the first confusing thing yeah. about the movie. Mm. The, Nazism and Satanism aren't really the same thing. I imagine back in, like, the 70s, where they didn't understand enough mm. about, you know, like, We need a shorthand like, for evil shits going on yeah, in this kid's playroom. this is bad. Yeah. But Has, I'm starting to think you might be a Satanist, because you've defended the I- 
I might be. Now. I might be. Twice Who knows? Now. Hail I Satan. Might, I might be. Hail Satan. I might, I might well, secretly be one. The whole name thing is interesting to me because it does seem like she raised them in tandem with the Satanists. Mm. So I think maybe that was the only thing that she had. Mm. Here, I'm going to defend this terrible movie. Um, <laughs> the only thing that she had some kind of control over was like, no, I am. his name is Andrew. Mm. Not in, in, but, but also, like, you think she would have chosen something a little bit different? Like, maybe Chris? You know, yeah, like not, Andrew, not, Adrian, they're yeah, very, yeah. you know, I guess maybe yeah. not to confuse the child. Mm. I mean, that that really does go into it because, like, she'll say every once in a while, oh, you, you do like the light, right? You always you know, like lean towards the light. And Andrew goes, eh, sometimes, sometimes I like the dark. <laughs> no, I gotta get my kid away from these Satanists. Uh, okay. He's so ambiguous. <laughs> I mean, the true name thing, it, it makes you think that, like, okay, we're going with, like, a split personality type thing. And sometimes, mm. he, he's Rosemary, the baby. sometimes Rosemary's baby will be good and sometimes he will be bad. And they kind of do that, but not really. I mean, like, he, the he, performance from the actor is... He, it, he walks the line. He lives in both worlds. He is the daywalker. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, they don't go far enough with it. Um, no. There's like this blink and you'll miss it moment where I guess they're like establishing the fact that Rosemary has been raising the kid, but like the the, the group of Satanists have been like supporting them and I guess like paying for their, their house and everything. They've been paying for everything. They've been paying for his clothes. Yeah, they're like, Rosemary, you don't have to join our yeah. cult, but we want you to raise this kid because he's, yeah, he's going to topple the world for us. The only like brief scene that we are shown of like something weird going on is for some reason we are shown uh, uh, Adrian slash Andrew um, in an Easter egg hunt, mm -hmm. but it's like an evil Easter egg hunt yeah. because he like <laughs> finds black eggs in the grass, and then when he finds them, he crushes them with his hand, mm. and all the Satanists are all like, "Oh, how delightful! <laughs> yeah. Yes, oh, evil and whatnot." And then Rosemary's over here going all like, "That, that ain't right." And it's just kind of all like. Would Satanists celebrate Easter? That's a very they religious holiday. Well, no, but they they killed Christ on Easter. Ah, so they're, they're celebrating that far. Right. They're just like, no, we just get it up until like the Sunday morning. They're and then as yeah. of Monday afternoon, forget it. They're celebrating yeah. the aspects <laughs> that they I, enjoy. Yeah. What I loved about the characterization of of Rosemary and her and Adrian in this film was that at the same time she's like, it seems at first like we're fight. She's fighting for her child and she's you know wanting to get him out of the situation, but then she gets on the phone with them and she's like I'll kill him I'll, I'll kill I'll him do it, I swear I won't even think twice about it and I I loved that like I will say I was so on board with the sequel for the first 25 20 minutes or so mm -hmm. Like, I was so when on board. When, when board. Rosemary is a carryover character? Yes! Yeah. But, <laughs> I'm like, there she is! Like, I just, I loved the... As soon as she said... I think I have it written down on my nose. As soon as she said, I'll kill him, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm into this. Yeah. Like, I love... Like, well, how... Like, Infant there's a side. Bit of Hell yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, he's a child by then. Child aside, whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. um, child, I'm sure child aside but, is what it's called. <laughs> yeah. But I think that's an interesting story for, like, you know, just putting it up against the original. She fought so hard mm -hmm. to have this baby and for, to have it be her child and then in the side a sequel we're going to explore her dual desire to love him and also d urge to kill him like i just was so yeah. on board with that she, and then they really fucked it with the time jump she wants to love That's her child but as the spawn of satan she knows that this is bad news for yeah, the human yeah. race yeah. yeah so like they so i know what we'll do we'll put her on a bus and kill her <laughs> we'll literally we'll put her on her bus and kill her question mark because it really oh, is ambiguous yeah. as to what happens to i Rose mean Barry i almost think movie. like they were yeah like planning for more films or something like that. It like, really yeah. does feel like a, like this is like the setup for like like a Rosemary's Baby and then TV what show, also possibly. To, yeah, yeah. Uh, man, there are so many plots that this movie goes towards. It, like by the time we get to him when he's an adult, this feels like the fourth movie in what should have been a Rosemary's Baby right. series. Because this is yeah. yeah, this movie is like divided up into chapters. Yeah, that, or or books as it pretentiously uh, <laughs> calls itself and everything. And yeah, with every book, there's like a bit of a time jump. So you really do feel like any number of these stories could be its own sequel yeah. to Rosemary's Baby. A, yeah. a movie that, I'm just going to say it after having seen this, didn't need a sequel. And yeah. what this sequel implies is that it actually needs like five sequels. <laughs> this, this, this is this is yeah, a, this, this is, is a, a rich uh, tapestry of mm. stories that we could weave within the universe of Rosemary's Baby. Yeah, uh, and uh, I mean, I don't agree. 
Yeah. So, I think it's a pretty good story on its own. It has a good ending. Yeah. Rosemary, as she's like running uh, away from the Satanist, you know, hides out in a synagogue, hallowed grounds where I guess like the Satanist can't get to him while she plans her next move, which involves calling up our, her old ex guy who has now uh, become the toast of Hollywood. He's, like, he's gotten Midwest. everything he wanted. Yeah. Yeah. And so she, she calls him up asking, asking for money. Uh, and I, I look, Guy is such a reprehensible character in the first movie. I had this inkling that are they going to have a redemption for him like he feels remorse for what he did to his fiance yeah. does he feel bad for how like he got everything he wanted at the expense of this woman and his child does he feel bad about being indebted to the satanic cult nah no, not really. No, he's more he's more of the main villain of this movie than the Satanists actually mm-hmm. are, because it's it's more about this I was genuinely going into this, I I didn't even realize Guy was gonna be a character mm-hmm. in this. It felt like his story was over. Mm-hmm. And I was surprised by how much of Guy is mm-hmm. in this movie, significantly more than Rosemary. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. like by like the third act, he becomes kind of like not quite the secondary lead, but like we keep going back to him enough times mm-hmm. that he be, he becomes like a, a central figure in this story. Yeah. Well, I think they're they're trying to rot a lot of drama out of that. Like, look how mm-hmm. awful it is that this father is continuing to torture his son, who's the son of Satan. Mm-hmm. You know, it, like. Uh, yeah, I think that they just felt like, or whoever wrote this, they were like, this is where the audience is going to tap it's, in. Like, this mm-hmm. is the emotional. It's such a weird sort of relationship, though, because Guy uh, tellingly isn't Adrian's uh, father. Mm-hmm. Uh, Satan is his father, uh, which we yeah. which we learn from a line of dialogue at the end of, of the movie. Uh, and he's, like, essentially been, like, paid off by, like, these Satanists and everything. He, he doesn't really have any reason to be a part of this story, and yet people keep... Forcing him back into yeah. the narrative. He wants nothing to do with this. He's cut shit. out. His hands. His hands are. Well, his hands aren't clean. His hands yeah. are, are dirty. Yeah, but Rosemary bloody, but raises yeah. up and says, "Like, hey, you owe us money. Drop it off at these like PO boxes." People keep calling Guy <laughs> under the assumption that he's going to help them. Yeah, and I'm the just, multiple that... people do, and it's just like, don't call this guy for help. He's the oh. worst person to call for help. <laughs> and like, such a terrible like backstepping on their deal with him. And he's like, "No, we had a deal. This was the end of the deal." And they're like, "That's what you thought was the end of the deal. Yeah. This is the new but deal." Satan. But, yeah, ah, I don't Satan know anymore. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Real, as, yeah. I love how when Roman's on the phone with him, say like, "Here's what you're gonna do." For us, everyone behind him is just chanting "Hail Satan, Hail Satan." I do have to say they overdid it with the <laughs> chanting. Re- it was Holy like shit. you get three chanting scenes max in a film, and that's pushing it. And there was like seven. In yeah, this, in this film, and especially where like he's on the phone with him. You, I just wanted to see him like turn to the guys and go, "Guys, could you lay off for a second? Like I'm trying to have a talk here." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Rosemary runs away with her baby, mm-hmm. uh, and we look at what's happening to it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, they run away and they get on. They get on like a bus, and then well, before uh, that, they meet um, uh, Ginger from Gilligan's Ginger Island. Ginger from Gilligan's <laughs> Island is in this movie. Yeah, yeah. She uh, she happens to, to witness Adrian beating up some bully kids who are giving him some guff when uh, his she, mom's on the phone. With she's guy. a she's a sex worker who has a trailer near this bus is that stop. It? She was. A, I think a there was there was like a line of dialogue that someone someone oh. I think mentioned. Hmm. Uh, well, and regardless, she is... Like, she a, was like, that guy's not my uncle kind of She's thing. a lady who lives near this rest stop mm-hmm. in a trailer. Mm-hmm. One can infer things based on that, well, I maybe suppose. maybe she just had a trailer. Maybe she like, just has a trailer. Who knows? Hashtag fan life. Well, I don't know. She was a very well-dressed uh, 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 sex worker, if that was the case. She looked very elegant. I I think it might have been like a like a passing line of dialogue from Roman who said right. she's she's like a, a lady. Anyway, she's like this lady who is unconnected to all of this satanist nonsense. <laughs> uh and and she sees yes, yeah, so Adrian gets in an altercation with these two boys. This whole scene was very confusing the way mm-hmm. it like played out Mm -hmm. and i think i understand what happened so he gets into an altercation with like two boys who like steal his toy and are like bullying him Mm -hmm. and then the eyes glow and flash red the biggest special effect of the movie but they keep going back to the incredible they they put they put a couple of light 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 brights in his eye yeah Yeah. and just say hold it here uh and then something happens to the kids they fall over Mm -hmm. or whatever he's like getting into their head he gives them vertigo Yeah. Yeah. yeah Uh, and As, then, and then, so, like, uh, Ginger comes over, and, like, that's her name. Uh, like, come, come hang out on my trailer for a bit, I'll keep you guys safe. And I, then she goes to check out on the kids, sees that they're dead, 
there's like a phone that's off the hook and that's the Satanist like chanting a spell at her, which uh, Because Rosemary was on the phone to Guy, guy? I, I think so. Yeah. But then I think like the Satanists were on like a like a oh, par- I, got, I got another line here. It Hold was on. like a party line or <laughs> yeah. something. I don't know. But anyway, they hypnotized this woman over the phone because when she comes back to her trailer, mm. she's fully on Team Satan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it happened. And so, but like because this scene is so confusingly shot, mm-hmm. she goes back. And we hear, like, a line of dialogue from a policeman saying, like, everyone's fine, no one's hurt. Mm -hmm. But then she goes back to Rosemary and the kid, and she lies and says that Adrian Adrian broke their necks. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's so confusingly shot, I didn't know who to believe in that moment. I didn't really know what was going on. It's not until Rosemary uh, gets put on a bus out of the movie (laughs) uh, that that I guess I'm able to connect the dots. I'm all like, oh, I guess she was tempted through the powers of Satan. These mm. Satanists work fast. Because she couldn't have been on that phone call for like more than like a minute or two. They have a very... And she's fully in now. They have a, a very far reach. And if they are capable of hypnotizing people from several states away over the phone, well, what's to stop them from doing like their global takeover right now? I mean, there's a precedent for it. I mean, like if you remember in the first movie, it takes like a couple of hours to convince Guy in the first movie to sign over his wife's womb mm. to Satan. Like, it really is. He, like, he really comes to that I conclusion. I mean, normally that's the kind of thing you just decide really quickly. Mm. Yeah. That's yeah. A- they're like, yes oh, no. oh, money, oh, money and fame. Yeah, take, yeah, take my wife's. Yeah, take, take my wife's body. She's not take using my wife, it. Please <laughs> take my wife, please. That was how that joke yeah. came about. Yeah, oh, okay. uh, but uh, yeah, and, and then, that, that's the end of the book of Rosemary. <laughs> she, yeah, she gets put on a bus, uh, which doesn't have a driver. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, and I guess she, she, does, she doesn't clock when no. she first gets onto it. She gets on. She's like, "Where is my seat?" And then it's, <laughs> and then she hears chanting. I, guys, I'm I mean, going to be honest with you. I was playing with my cat, and that's not a euphemism. Better use of your time. Playing with my my kitty before giving her her final de- meal in this sequence. So I also found it very confusing. Mm. Um, no, you got it. Like you got it. She gets on, and then she's like, "Uh oh!" And then she goes back and looks, and there's no one driving the yeah. bus. Yeah. Door closes. Door uh, closes. Yeah. Ginger's got Adrian in her arms, and they peel off. What yeah. a way to go! Yeah. And that's Aww. that's the last we see of the, the, the main character from the first movie. Do you guys think that there was an element of because because Mia, Mia Farrow is so distinct, and I do think that Patty Duke does a good job. Sure, she of, does what's and, what's asked of her. Yeah, yeah, I she emulates that sort of like keening quality that Mia Farrow had in that like oh mm. just like that melodramatic you know 1960s she movie. is on 10 the entire movie well and Patty yeah. Duke was in consideration for the original role in the right, original yeah. film too oh, interesting. This, this is her shot yeah 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 this is her chance but it's and so it's interesting that Mia Farrow didn't do the film and but I feel like that's understandable um but then yeah but do you think that they, they killed her off so quickly because I don't know Mia Farrow is so distinct and she's such a big star and they're like okay well we have to have Rosemary in the film but let's just it's get in the rid fucking of her title <laughs> as soon as possible because yeah. it's like like patty duke is not mia farrow and mm. i don't know for me i was kind of like if i was a screenwriter or a producer if it, like how can i make this a success i would say i don't know if i wanted about rosemary the whole time let's make it about adrian it really didn't feel like like it felt so odd because i i truly wasn't sure whether or not what the fate of rosemary was mm-hmm. like we just see yeah. her get put on yeah. a bus like, did that bus stop eventually? Did the Satanist drive it off a cliff? We, we don't know. We're not privy to, to this information, so Maybe I don't know. Maybe they're still working on the, on the sequel. And then Adrian, they're <laughs> still, they could, yeah. they could do it. They got to recast everyone again, because everyone's, de- everyone's dead, dead now. Dead. Mm-hmm. Uh, I but, don't know. They, they had, like, three different scripts for a Rosemary's Baby sequel, and they decided, fuck it, we're going to do all three of them in this movie. <laughs> yeah. We're going to condense this. Where the second movie ends is, like, our first commercial break. And near, <laughs> near the end of the movie, Adrian is talking to someone and does say, "Is all like I gotta find, I gotta find Guy, and I gotta find Rosemary." And it's all like it's it's laying right? the seeds mm. to be all like, "Oh, Rosemary's still out there." I thought she was coming back, frankly. Absolutely. Yeah. And then the movie just ends. Yeah, it the movie just ends. kind of ends. It just ends. Yeah. And Hot it, final moment. I will say, we'll get there. We'll yeah. get there. Oh, so uh, now it's time to start out with the the book of Adrian. Yeah. Adrian has grown up. He's a young hotshot who drives a black Trans Am, he, and he's, he, he's always played. got a shirt unbuttoned to about uh, nipple level. He's so played can... by the great Canadian character actor Stephen McCaddy, who just has one of those amazing faces that has just gotten angular. M- more and more Very interesting angular. as he has gotten older. With yeah. with every progressive year, that guy just gets more and more interesting looking. I recognized him as Elaine's therapist in Seinfeld, who she oh, dated. He refused right. to let her break That's up with right. him. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, I mean, he just has one of those faces. He looks like the kid, like, when he was a child, he would be the little shithead on the school year. You know what I mean? <laughs> He's got that, like, really light hair, mm. and he just looks like his name should be, like, Chuck. Or, like, yeah. Chad, you know, mm. and, like, always getting in trouble. He's, like, the dirty kid at school. Yeah, he's always talking his way out. He's the scum, yeah, he's exactly. scum bomb. It was he, great casting. He's, like, he's, great got, casting. he's got a, uh, a slingshot in his back pocket. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. Picks his nose. Yeah. 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 yeah, he gets in drag races all the time, gets in constant trouble yeah, with the yeah. law. He's a bad boy. Yeah, so but, Of course but, Satan's child would be a bad boy. Yeah, but he's got two things that are keeping him on the straight and narrow. One is that when he was a kid, I guess, like, he wore his mother's cross, so he always has, yes. like, a cross burned into his chest which at one bur- point. Which burned Burns him sometimes, but not all other the time. Times. Yeah. What's with that? Yeah, I know. It's like he's I putting it on his face, and I was like, "Oh my god, this is a, a moment of self-flagellation." And then he's going to have happens. a cross mark on his face yeah, for the yeah. entire movie. But no, it's, no, it was just that one time. The makeup time department called in and were like, "Are you serious?" I guess it's whenever like this Satan is not in the budget. Satan is like strongest in him is when the yeah. cross starts. Well, to Well, I think they're trying to. Oh, maybe this is actually interesting storytelling, and we're just not seeing it. Maybe they're trying to say. No, it's probably maybe, not that. Maybe this is a brilliant <laughs> I wouldn't movie. Go that far with maybe this story. movie's a masterpiece, and we're just not smart <laughs> enough to appreciate yeah. it. The other thing that he has going for him is that he has a, a, a good Christian boy as his best friend, Peter, who's yeah. always dressed in white, and I think he... Mildly would... homoerotic uh, friendship Mildly. with Peter. <laughs> Uh, like now we're getting to what this film is. Yeah, really. uh, Peter. He's played by an actor named David Huffman. I always, you know, I always like read like the Wikipedia articles on mm-hmm. on all of the actors through here. And uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, the the uh, the big thing about David uh, Huffman that's uh, worth mentioning is that he was murdered. No. He was straight up murdered. He was murdered by a by Adrian. S- but yeah, he, the, the curse. Oh, no. The curse continued. Oh my God, we well, saw the movie. Well, he found the bus Rosemary was on. He was like, Are you going to Chicago? Yeah, actually, yeah. ironically, he was murdered by a child. He was murdered by a 16-year-old kid with a screwdriver. No. Oh, God. Uh, the story is he uh, was in a play... And he uh, uh, dropped off uh, cookies for like the the cast and the crew. And he, this is what it says on Wikipedia: He was sitting in his car playing his bagpipes <laughs> when he saw this sixteen year old kid get in an alter a violent altercation with another man, and then ran away. And then he he was a bit of a white knight because he he chased after Aww. the kid, confronted him in a park, and then the the kid stabbed him twice in the the stomach, and he bled out. Oh boy! Yeah, I know. Yeah. What a what a horrifying story. Oh. Right? God, yeah. No. Um, yeah, so it's all like the curse of Rosemary's Baby continues yes. with with this actor playing this role. I mean, I knew... And they... he's the only character that gets murdered in the story. I, I guess Guy, eventually. I, but, I mean, yeah. I know that the ancient Scots used to play the bagpipes as they rode into battle, but that's a little ridiculous. I mean, that, that's just... That's such an amazing little, like... <laughs> Uh, what de- detail, detail to this. <laughs> what a detail to have in the story. I mean, I thought you were going to go the yeah. other way, where like he was playing his bagpipes in the car, and someone was like, "Shut the fuck up!" And oh like, because st- I mean, there's I... certain instruments that you can play casually in your car. I wouldn't say a bagpipe is one of them. But... I guess the moral of the story is just don't do anything good. Like, don't try yeah, to don't, save yeah, anyone. Don't, don't be yeah. a don't be don't, a hero. Don't Hail, don't Satan. Be a hero. Hail Satan! Hail Satan! Hail Satan! Then don't yeah. be a hero. Hail Adrian. Yeah, exactly. So Adrian, uh, he lives with uh, with Ginger, who is yes. now, I guess, like his adoptive aunt. And she Who now runs a casino. She runs a combination. Well, I mean, yes, she she runs uh, the Martins Castle and Casino, which, as far as I can tell, consists of a bar, two craps tables, a dance floor, and a house band that is never not rocking the fuck out. <laughs> I love every time they cut to the interior of that casino, and that band is just fucking giving her. Oh, it's, it's also it, go ahead. No, it just makes Adrian so annoying because his life <laughs> is kind of awesome. Yeah, he's he's getting a free ride. It seems mm-hmm. like he knows. He, I think she even reminds him, like you have to be nice to them because they gave us a lot of money when your mother died. Yeah, and so you're basically a kept child. You get your own rock band. You get your own bar. <laughs> your best your best friend slash your boyfriend gets to come. He's always looking out for you and everything. Yeah. yeah. Like, why are you so upset all the why time? Is, why is this 35-year-old man still living with his adopted <laughs> Okay, <aunt? laughs> look, we got to talk about this. What this, this section with, like, the adult Adrian, what year is this supposed to be? Good question. Because, okay, if we're going off of uh, Rosemary's Baby takes place in the year that it was released, 1968, and then, uh, at, like, like, Adrian as, like, a kid is, like, six years, six, seven years after that, mm. we can go as all, like, okay, it's 1974, the year that this movie was mm. released. Then we have, like, this massive time jump. How old would you say Adrian is supposed to be? Is he supposed to be, like, 18 or 19? 
You, I think he's meant to be thirty because he's meant to be thirty because yeah, so it, this this scene is taking place in like the nineties. Because the cast of us make this point where like they they call Jesus Christ the other guy, and they mention how Pretty like funny. he didn't start. Pretty good joke. He didn't start following his uh, assigned destiny until he was in his thirties. Yeah. So they're saying like, well, now that he's in his thirties, he's yeah. at that but point. All the he's he's supposed he's... to be twenty nine. Okay, so it's like nineteen ninety one, but all the aesthetics <laughs> are like nineteen seventy four. Well, like, the hell? band is playing very distinctly seventies psychedelic oh, music it's, the entire it's your, time. It's, it's your Uriah Heep. You know, it's Blue Oyster. You know what? It's a retro. It's a retro. <laughs> it's a it's a retro casino. Yeah, is what yeah. it is. But guys, I mean, what were they supposed to do? Their budget probably wasn't huge. They couldn't go like you know what would have been great is if it actually looked like the Jetsons. Yeah, yeah. if they went like. Like super <laughs> futuristic with it and everything. Kind yeah. of like how Bubble in, domes uh, on cars yeah. and everything. Yeah, like how in Back to the Future we're supposed to already have hoverboards by yeah. now. Like we're supposed to... I would love at least like one line of explanation because you can infer this but like I would love like one line of explanation as to how Roman and Minnie are still fucking alive. During mm. all of this, because like... And look younger. Like I, I had to look up whether that was... Um, uh, the same actress because I'm like she looks great like what happened yeah. she must have I don't know if they just caked on her makeup or what but mm. she looks like she aged and then yeah and then like I don't know if it was meant to be like uh, uh, like, a, like a lie in the first Rosemary's Baby because like near the end of that movie like the doctor is specifically saying Roman doesn't have very long to live he's, he's very ill it could mm. that could have been you know like uh, subterfuge and they were they were trying to pull pull the rug out of from under right. Rosemary and everything but, but like they're still very old people so I would have loved like one line of dialogue that said like oh Satan keeps us young mm -hmm. or something and you can like I guess you can like assume that that's what's going on mm -hmm. but uh, again it, it's very odd particularly with this huge time jump yeah. And and they look like exactly the same. Like one of them would be like one of them is literally the same. Yeah, one of them is exactly the same. And it doesn't look like any time has passed. And Ruth Gordon was quite old when when she when she played that role. I'm pretty so. impressed by that actually. She looks great. Yeah. Oh, she she hasn't lost a step. Like yeah. she's still got that same kind of whip smart. She is pretty much the best part of this movie. She is. Oh. We needed a lot more mini. Unfortunately, absolutely, there's not absolutely. there's not enough of I her. I love her with the reverse psychology. It was always like they would always good cop bad cop. Her husband would come in and be like, "Do you want to do this really bad thing?" And she'd be like, "Oh, I said it was a bad idea." Like yeah. even with this, with giving Adrian the knife mm. with as the gift, and she's like, "I told him it was a terrible gift. Don't take it. Don't take it." And then, great, of course, they take it. They're a great pairing because everything he says is like so highfalutin and highbrow. Yeah. And everything she says is like right from the gutter. Of this. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. No, but Minnie's still around. Minnie's still voicing her opinion. She's still uh, making people drink suspicious liquids. Yeah. Well, they're, uh, com they're coming into town because they're posing as his godparents. And uh, yeah, they're coming well, into town. They are kind of his godparents. Like, or or god Satan parents. God uh, there's even a line where he says, like, <laughs> godparents. Or go Here's yeah, godfather. Right. Aren't you <laughs> godfather? Anyways. Um, yeah, they're coming into town to celebrate his uh, 30th birthday or whatever. And uh, yeah, Adrian's acting out and he's picking fights with bikers and shit like that. Well, okay. they But they want him to pick fights with bikers. Because uh, he needs to be bloodied. He needs to be bloodied, mm -hmm. as they keep saying over and over again. It's yeah. uh, like it, he has, and they're disappointed with him because this is like the point where like they have to. They're doing like some sort of ceremony which will like fully transfer Satan into his body, mm -hmm. and then they can take over the world. Uh, but like he he hasn't like murdered anyone. Yeah. Well, cause, yet. Cause he hasn't Peter like always committed the sin. Because Peter always intervenes or whatever, right? Because yeah. I don't know how much ah Peter. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how much Peter knows about who Adrian is. I don't know how much Adrian knows about who he well, is. Well, they, they both seem to have some kind of a sense because that's the whole thing. Like, I think that's the whole motivation behind his sort of, like, Hamlet-esque-ness of he's mm -hmm. so moody and, like, because uh, he, he suspects that there's something dark about himself. Mm -hmm. And his boyfriend knows it, too. <laughs> <laughs> They're just canonically boyfriends now yeah, in this timeline, now, which is yeah. fine. Hey, hey, there's nothing more Satan than that. There's nothing, well, yeah. Well, your thoughts, not yeah, mine. That's your <laughs> I think love is love, Cass. Love is love. <laughs> oh, I, think, I, 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 I think there's a little bit of Satan in it. I think there's a little bit of Satan in it. Anyway. So, like, yeah, they show up at the casino for his 30th birthday or whatever. He's got a massive birthday cake with him, like, too big for, like, a, I a love that they man. Made, I love that they made a birthday cake for the Antichrist. There's, like, a, there's really a flashback is. sequence where it's, like, you know, a <laughs> Satan-themed birthday party for this guy, and it's yeah. so fucking awesome. Um, uh, and, look, like, I, I mentioned earlier, like, uh, 
Minnie's thing in the first movie is that she kept making like these gross drinks for for Rosemary, and but it was like presented in that movie as all like these are like health drinks and they'll help like the pregnancy along and mm-hmm. it's part of like um the critique on like uh, uh modern medicine versus like holistic type stuff and everything yeah. like that. in this movie Minnie just like hands adrian like a, a golden goblet <laughs> and she says here drink this it's like prunes and leftovers and whatever and adrian's just kind of like all right well we just drink it and then he passes out and it's all like why why would you drink that man come on mm. have some th- what's the reason what's the reasoning behind this you just drink anything that anyone hands to you if it's hey, in a on, goblet on my birthday i pretty much drank whatever that was put in front of me i suppose so yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of plot by convenience so sure. all, so the entire cult shows up to the casino and they're they're doing their chanting thing they don't ask peter to leave he's just allowed to hang out and enjoy the floor show or whatever yeah he's not he's not privy to like the the the, the backroom satan deals yeah. They invite yeah. Guy, over, Guy, and, and like you know, there is a point where like Peter yeah. suspects something weird is going on because uh, yeah. in universe Guy is like he's like world... George, he's like George Clooney. Yeah, it'd be like if yeah. George Clooney just like wandered into the middle of yeah. like you know your, yeah. your regular watering hole, right? Yeah. So and he 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 guesses that something's going on, and, and this... Guy has like um like a handler. He has like a like a satanic handler right. who mm. like. Yeah. Is like driving him around and everything, and like yeah. oh, I guess on the surface he's like his assistant, but secretly he's working for the cast of Vets and and is also like uh, making sure Guy doesn't doesn't step out of line or yeah. whatever. Oh, yeah. yeah, and at one point doesn't Guy try and tell him something, and he's like, I would tell no one except for you, thinking that he could trust this guy, and this guy is like, No, dude, I'm, like the, I'm the not, Satanist hired I'm, me. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not I'm your not, friend. I'm yeah, not your I'm buddy. not here for you. Yeah. I'm here for them. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not your buddy, Guy. Okay, so they're at the party. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, friend. Um, <laughs> speaking of guy, you know what else he also has? A uh, nice little bit of gray, little gray temples. He's a real silver fox uh, going on. And that's why I said Clooney. Yeah, because he's got he's got the Clooney hair. It's meant to show you that time has passed. <laughs> And and he's getting he's getting worried about about his, his his station. But yeah, they they've specifically asked Guy to come because they've done like um, they've done like seances mm. or or like rituals in the past and it hasn't worked. Mm. So they're saying like you were at like the first one, so maybe the problem is that you haven't been at the other ones. Yeah. I don't know. It's like a weird explanation they give to try and it's get him back into the story. Movie logic, right there. Yeah. It really yeah. is. Rosemary, like, well, you killed Rosemary, so she couldn't. You come put her on her bus. You got, you got. She's <laughs> we, out. we forgot where we dropped her off. Yeah, so we like, don't know. Next she's still driving <laughs> currently, right now. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. they paint uh, Adrian up in some Joaquin Phoenix Joker makeup, <laughs> and they do a little seance thing that uh, they, they feel like nothing really worked. That because uh, he's supposed to be possessed by now. Then all of a sudden. <laughs> To the power of rock, Satan is summoned. <laughs> this was so con- confounding. What was going like, on? Is all Roman's like, like, wait, turn that thin Lizzie up. Go to- <laughs> it's all like, wait, let's let's see where let's see where this goes. And yeah, Adrian just goes out to the dance floor, yeah. and we keep expecting him to do something because Peter mentions earlier uh, uh, Adrian is also like the lead singer of a band yeah we never see I, it's all I like, see him how, sing we never see him do what, that. A, what a setup yeah. and you don't follow that through you can, you have to have like a musical number in your 70s Satan inspired fucking like movie and he, we never get there and, and like he goes out to the floor I thought that this was like he was gonna like corrupt the members of the casino through like the power of heavy metal or something but no he just like dances and flails around <laughs> and all the satanists are in like a corner watching him going yes I yes wrote, it's working i wrote down Is it? <laughs> nearly verbatim what roman says because i had to like rewind it because i'm all like what's happening now so like roman's watching him do this and he says of course almost better than the mere shedding of blood There must be more joy in hell over the corruption of one innocent than all the chanting of the ungodly. We've won! Mm. And I'm like, the fuck are you talking (laughs) about, man? (laughs) He's just grooving out to, like, Black Magic Woman or something. I mean, 1976, right? Mm. Like, it is interesting because the 70s were like, you know, we're heading towards the 80s, which were such a more conservative time Mm -hmm. in so many different ways and and like fiscally and also just culturally so i don't know it's it i guess it's a product of its time 
it's just a commentary on like you know, people's perception. There's death of, to this film, guys. <laughs> death that we're not even into. Of, of, of people's perception of, of what it, it meant to be yeah. like like a devil worshiper back then. Yeah. And like all all of those like this psychedelic hippy dippy nonsense yeah. is. It feels like the plot of this film feels like how they write you know a lot of MOWs that come out today. Movie of the weeks for people who don't know. Mm. Um, you it's know, an industry it's, term. It's yeah. an industry term. Uh, you know, so many of the plots are plots of convenience. Like, you just need this thing to happen. So let's just find an interesting way of making that happen. But it can't be too interesting because we have a tight budget. And there's just so many aspects of this film that feel really half-baked. I just don't know what the thing they were building to was. Like, <laughs> I mean, I, I that's my favorite part of the movie. Yeah. It's just yeah, like, yeah, like yeah. the fucking like 70s metal is what wakes him up and summons Satan's. And I'm like, yeah, that tracks. Yeah, of course. Why the fuck not? I literally wrote down, oh, is the power of 70s rock summoning Satan? And the very next line I wrote was, yeah! yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's a sex scene. <laughs> There is? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, but that, like, that's the like book later of, on. That's the Book of Andrew. That's the Book of Andrew. Oh, yeah. Yeah. right. Yeah. Wait. Uh, we're still in the Book of Adrian. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, it's like while he's tripping out on stage, Guy leaves, and Peter is like, you know something's going on here. You have to save him. And uh, during this time, there's been like thunder and lightning, and a power line is just like casually <laughs> down. Yeah, yeah, the power throwing didn't go sparks out. Sparks off next to, right next to the casino where these two guys are standing. So guy with his bare hands touches the live wire, survives, and electrocutes Peter, who dies. And he does it so casually. <laughs> it's so funny to watch him just be all like, "Get out of my way! Come on, man! Ah, uh, you know what? Fuck you!" And he just, yeah, he just grabs a live wire and yeah. just lights this guy up, and then he gets into his his limousine and he drives away yeah. with like the same casualness like one might step on an ant like it's <laughs> so weird well that's this Hollywood elite for you yeah. Yeah. but uh, that's enough to shock Adrian out of his trance and because you know his his good buddy his lover Peter is now dead right. and uh, he, he doesn't know who Guy is but he knows he's responsible and I guess he blacks out and that is the end of the book of Adrian and we go to the book of Andrew where he wakes up in the uh, in the care of, of an insane asylum oh my god I completely <laughs> forgot about the insane asylum right yeah. that's like a, that's like that's like the last 30 minutes of the movie <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, but, well, I, it's not surprising because, like, it feels so tacked on and, mm. and confusing. Now, like, the way this movie is structured is really annoying. Like, you're, you're watching this and, like, it almost feels like they should start in the insane asylum. Yeah. yeah. You know? What happened to me? You don't remember? Well. Yeah. And, and then, then that's the movie. Yeah, and then everything sort of, like, folds out from there and, like, the revelations keep coming back and we can, like... Uh, have him like have all these dream sequences of Rosemary on a bus screaming like no mm. let me off and everything and he can be all like what is that is that my mother I don't remember these things I mean how great would that have been because yeah. that's literally what happened to Rosemary in the first film like to keep everything sort of mysterious and just out of reach of reality is what yeah. the first film so much of its power that's where I think they really went wrong with the second one was like the claustrophobia and the controlled sort of isolation of the first film was what gave it its punch, was what made it an art house film in so mm. many ways. And then this film is just so goddamn plot heavy. This like, is, uh, this is it's, like an, a, it's a, a classic a, movie of the week. Like yeah, it's yeah. just like this thing and then this thing and then this thing, and they're gonna up the they're gonna up the stakes and they're gonna up the uh, like non believability of everything, and mm. it's just gonna get chaos. Like they jump the shark. As soon as Ro they put Rosemary on the bus, it was like, okay, this is done. This chapter, I feel, does the most tipping of the hat towards the first movie. Uh, because there is an element of, he doesn't know exactly what's going on. There's an element of characters gaslighting him. Totally, yeah. totally, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, And once again, he's contained, mm -hmm. you know, in this one spot. So, yeah, he has this nurse laying down. Pretty like, hot. Pretty hot, like nurse lady, <laughs> uh, who is just laying down um, everything that led up to this point. Like, uh, your birth certificate says Adrian. He's like, no, no, I, I, I'm Andrew. I, I, I know I'm Andrew. Okay, well, you're at a hospital for the criminally insane. He's like, I'm, I'm not insane, and I, I, I didn't kill anyone, and all, all that kind of crap. And then she's like, you have to believe me. It sounds so outlandish, but I think I'm blank, blank, blank. And she's totally cool with it. Which should be the first... Suspiciously so. Yeah, which should, yeah, that should be a bit of a tell for you, but... Uh... I'll, 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 be, I'll, be, I'll be honest, the, the movie kind of got me there. Not in the sense where where it's eventually revealed that she's part of the satanic conspiracy. Mm. Just more in, the, more in the fact that I was sitting there and going like, 
why is she instantly in on this? Why why is this woman risking her like job and career to like help this guy escape? Mm. I should have figured it out. I should have connected the pieces. Well, but there, uh, there's so many people who are in this cult, and that's like a carryover from the first movie, where like everyone's fu- this is a far-reaching cult. Everyone's everyone in the movie who's well, not the protagonist not only is in that, on it. Membership is good. Yeah. yeah not only that, but they they uh, supposedly can create new members with very little effect because I I I'm fairly certain what we're supposed to believe about Ginger from Gilligan's Island is that she wasn't a Satanist and then she picked up that phone and then as soon as she put the phone down she was all in and and so there must be like some form of hypnotism or Mm. suggestion or something that gets them to like get more people on their side. They should have done the hypnosis on Adrian. Andrew. Right? (laughs) Get him on board with this and he wouldn't be running off all the time. They even say in a voiceover because... The cast events are doing, like, play-by-play throughout the entire movie. In case you've lost the plot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, like, this movie, like, runs out of, like, steam so quickly because while while this plot is going on, while, like, this, this late third-act plot mm. of Adrian being in an insane asylum and, like, escaping and trying to figure out what's going on, there's, like, intercut with scenes with Guy and the cast events just kind of dicking around. Yeah. Just, like, sitting by the pool, like, talking about, like, their master plan and whatever, and then, like, the cast events get into a car and it's all like, all right, well, we're leaving now. Now, and we're just kind of like, why are we watching this? What does this have to do with anything? <laughs> but they make a point when uh, Adrian, sorry, Andrew at this stage, is escaping the um, uh, the insane asylum with the help of the nurse, that, oh, that, like, he used, like, the, the dark powers of, of Satan to persuade her to, to go, to do his bidding. They mentioned that, so I was like, oh, okay, so this woman isn't a part of the cult. She is being persuaded to help him along through, like, Satan powers or whatever. That's that's I think what they said in a voiceover. It would help oh more if there was if there was more of like a like a visual mm. element. Like so we sometimes we see like the the, the shiny eyes sometimes. Mm. But if like you know if there was like a music change, if like mm. we there was like a tight zoom in on his face or whatever, mm. just something so the audience can know. Okay, now he's like evil. Yeah. You know now he's Adrian and yeah. now he's Andrew. But there's never there's never like a, a there's never a switch that mm. gets flipped for this character. But does he? Oh my gosh, I must have stopped paying attention. I was probably on my cell phone. Um, does he go evil at the end? He doesn't. They have sex. It kind of infers which... that he's good now at the yeah, end. Yeah, he's good now and yeah. she's evil. Because they missed they missed the evil window for Adrian. Yeah. <laughs> like that that birthday party was like the last chance they had but to get same Satan time, in him and they but, he's not he's not working anymore. Yeah. Yeah, but he seems to be able to impregnate her with, with now this demon seed. Yeah. So I think he is sure. Like, I think that what they're hoping for is that we settle into this idea yeah. of him being Andrew now, but really, he's he is Adrian, yeah. and he's going to impregnate her, and now she's going to have I, I, Devil's I, baby. I'm pretty sure it's just that he will always have those satanic powers in him, but he's choosing the side his of... His sperm. Of good. Yeah. yeah. He'll always have his the... His sperm <laughs> is evil. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we might as well talk about this now, like, sort of, like, jumping ahead to the the ending. What, what as you say, what, what ultimately happens is that... Uh, the, this uh, character's name. I do have the character's yeah. name right well, like, they're, they're on the road uh, because he says... Ellen. Like, Ellen is the name of the yeah, nurse. Yeah. He says, like, oh, I gotta track down Rosemary and I gotta find the man in the limousine. She asks him why. He never really elaborates on it. But yeah, so they're yeah. camping out at this uh, motel. What a and- missed opportunity because, like, they, they escape into, like, town or whatever. What a missed opportunity to have, like, Andrew, Adrian, walk by a movie theater and guys on a poster... Or something, yeah. you know, and it's all like, "There's, there's the man. That's the man who killed my friend." Or him, whatever. he's like the yeah. most famous he, actor in the he's world. He's George Clooney. He yeah. was in a movie with Paul Newman. You know, yeah, yeah and stuff and like that. And she'd be like, "Uh oh, maybe he is crazy, and I broke him out." Yeah, Uh-oh. but no, she's totally on board for reasons. In uh, what is a huge homage to the first movie, he even drops the line. Um, oh God, God, uh, I wrote it down. I'm Rosemary's baby. Look at me go. Rub a doop doo. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> I'm trying to he, remember he, the line she, too. Yeah. She gives him. She gives him a drink. And, oh, oh, the aftertaste. The, line. Yeah, it has a yeah. strange aftertaste to it or something. So like uh, mother like like mother like son. He gets drugged. Um, what was it called? It was start, Tannis Root. Yeah, yeah. That was it in the first. Yeah, one. not enough callbacks to Tannis Root. Tannis mm. Root. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
So, yeah, he's, he's drugged, and then uh, she... Remember <laughs> in the first movie when Mia Farrell's like, Tannis, anyone? I mean, that's a good joke. They should have found a way to brought that back. So much of a Tannis, anyone? I don't know. I'm slapping my knee. Um, yeah. So much like the first movie, he's raped. Yeah, against his against his will. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's, what, that's what that's what rape means. Uh, sorry. Was it against his will? Well, he was drugged. He, he, was didn't, drugged. he didn't really know what was going so on. Was, yes. mm-hmm. And then there's like, they... they they try to include like a parallel scene of like, cause like there's like the weird psychedelic thing where Rosemary's drugged and she imagines herself on a boat, mm-hmm. uh, and like there's there's all this weird imagery. The best this Some movie, of the best dream sequence mm-hmm. stuff ever. Jameson didn't way. like it. Jameson's uh, not a fan. I, I don't like avant garde stuff. <laughs> in my uh, yeah. uh, I think that scene's interesting. I, th- I think it's an interesting scene worth um. Uh, discussing because I don't from under- the original you from, the original, from the original because yeah. oh, I Jameson I heard your friends man <laughs> you I flat out haven't known me an hour and you're I... like ooh strike two buddy yeah, I mean I don't understand that dream sequence but I think it's interesting but I think that's to, dis- what, to discuss dr- dreams don't make any sense yeah. right mm-hmm. dream logic um, this movie tries to do something like that but the best they can manage is they just cut super briefly and Andrew is like tied in, in like the middle of like a dirt field mm-hmm. and Ellen is dressed like a bird she's, she's a bird dressed, lady she's dressed like a bird lady it's all like oh we're getting that psychedelic imagery again but it lasts like three seconds mm-hmm. and that's yeah. all we get out of it and you have a feeling like they maybe like shot like a little bit more but they had to edit and it for time he see, no he sees his mother too right he sees his mother like throughout the movie. He's having like flashbacks to her on right, the bus. Right, on the bus. Think, but he never yeah. saw, which is fucked because she never, he never saw her on the bus. Yes, he did when he was a kid. I mean, was, was he there? He was there. He was there, yeah. He, he was, was in the arms of Ginger. He was, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, okay. hey, when you're I, in the arms yeah, of Ginger, I mean, I'm, I'm it's hard, to, it's hard to picture anything else. But, but yeah, he's my to focus say, too. <laughs> I did really like this one line that what's her face, the nurse. Ellen. That Ellen, Ellen, Ellen said yeah, yeah. at the end of the film, which was, it's been 2,000 years of good, and now we're going into... It was like something along the lines, 2,000 years of good, and now it's time for 2,000 years of evil. Mm. Which I really liked that, because mm. I felt like, again, that ties into our current times. Like, it does feel... I'm like, yeah. that That was the thing that felt a little uh, prescient to me, because I, I'm i like, well, that's exactly how the last couple of years Look, if felt. you're going to do a sequel to Rosemary's yeah. Baby, do a sequel to Rosemary's Baby and have it be, like, the Satan won. And, like, the Antichrist is, like, in power or something. Mm-hmm. I know right. I know that's technically... Oh, that's the series. That's the series. That's, I feel like that that is yeah. the series, yes. There was... They did do sequels to The Omen, which is which is a very sort of parallel movie because it is yeah. about, like a, like, a devil child or whatever. The third sequel to The Omen is he's an adult and I think he's running for president or something. Mm. So I... And I haven't seen that, but I have a feeling that that kind of covers a lot of the same territory as this. This movie feels like a huge cop-out. And, like, this ending... Which, which I, I, want, I, want, I want to get to because th- this ending is kind of like th- the biggest uh, sin that this movie commits is that it kind of um, negates everything that happens in the first movie because they, they have like the spawn of Satan, Adrian. They have all of these years, they have like 30 years to get him ready, to prep him mm-hmm. for being the Antichrist. All these Satanists like dick around like they lose him for a period and then they get him back pretty quickly and then it, they, they let him have like his own personality and his opinions and everything where, whereas like they could have kept him like super isolated if they wanted to like yeah. keep him for like strictly like their purposes they could have like homeschooled or whatever and they just they they, they drop the ball mm. on like this one Satan kid so this movie ends with them saying alright let's try again let's get like this woman who is it, on, on our board, team, on board, on team Satan immediately with the actual satanic sperm already. Yeah. yeah so yeah. this just raises the question: Why didn't they do that in the first place? Why did they bother with Rosemary and keep her in the dark? Kaz, Kaz, you're looking too closely at it. That's what we do here. <laughs> you know that's what? that's the purpose of this podcast. I, I think. I mean, but the, like you know, you can't really ask that question because. That's the beauty of the first film is that she was unwitting, right? Mm-hmm. And maybe, and we don't know how Satan's logic work. Maybe it had to be a sacrifice like that, right? Like maybe it has to be somebody who, as pure as her. But it, it that but it doesn't suggested. see it doesn't seem like that's the case this time yeah. around because yeah. now they have an right. evil lady. Maybe with, they're working with, with an evolving theory. I think they are because in the book of Rosemary, after she gets taken away by the bus, there's one of the voiceovers from the Casavets, and there's one saying, of many voiceovers. Of many. They say that um, he also needs to be raised in the light because he's part of it. Gotta have him back. No, that was wrong. 
Adrian can't be raised like a mushroom in a dark cellar. He's part of the light. He needs it. So okay, they they tried they tried raising him like exclusively in the darkness, and that kind of like, that slipped through their fingers. You know, it was too tight of a grasp. So you know what? He can't. He's always going to try to stray from our path because he has that part of him. So tell you what, he spent eight years living in isolation, like surrounded by the satanic cult. Let's give him. 26, 27 years or whatever the fuck. To, to sow his wild oats. Exactly, yeah. Well, yeah, and everything that he seems to gravitate towards is sort of the, you know, he's a rock star, he mm. hangs out in this bar, at this casino, you know. He's not a prostitute. Like, and, I mean, like, the t for example, the tarot card, the devil, does not mean Satan. It means human pleasure. Mm. You know, it means addiction. It means like that un unchecked sort of like um, he extreme hedonistic uh, intake of pleasure. You know, and depending on how it comes up in a spread, it can it can say, oh, you've got this is something you should watch, or maybe you need to indulge yourself more. Mm. So there's two sides to it. You know, yeah. the idea of the devil what has always been indulgence, and so maybe you know by allowing Adrian to have a bit of a human life. Maybe you know, he'll just it feeds that part of himself. He's able to sort of like because he seems like an yeah. addict. So like when and, you first meet him, and he'll he'll on. he'll just naturally gravitate towards like the sinful sides of uh, right. the hedonistic sides. That's of their theory, but it doesn't yeah. work out for them. Well, I just know because Peter intervenes, right? <laughs> the, I just know like if I if I was Satan, I would just be like watching all of this go down from hell. I'd just be all like, you guys. <laughs> you guys are just fucking this up so bad. You're just making this more complicated than it needs to be. Mm -hmm. Oh my god! So Ellen gets hit by a car. <laughs> Ellen gets hit by a car that we find out is is driven by Guy. Because mm -hmm. I guess Guy, guy is like <sighs> they're inferring to Guy that like he needs to take care of the Adrian problem, or they're going to take care of him. Yeah, I think is what's happened. I'll be perfectly honest. I don't remember. Mm. I watched this movie two nights ago, and I don't actually remember what happens from here to here. Mm. Uh, but yeah, guy shows up at this hotel. Um, we think that Ellen has been uh, killed. It turns out uh, she she Survive. miraculously survived, and the baby is totally fine. Mm. Uh, guy guy ends up killing himself. Yeah. Basically, because he's trying to swerve. I guess he's trying to run over Adrian. He ends up rolling the car over, mm -hmm. and then he just opens the door and is all like, oh, it's the man from my head, mm -hmm. and now he's dead. I won't have any answers. And and Adrian just walks away down <laughs> Highway 45. Yeah. And Never he's to be just, seen again, and I he's guess. Just and he's just confused. I'm all like, what's what's my place in the world? I don't know. And that's it. And the movie ends. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I do like that final shot. I do appreciate that final shot of the pan up, and then there's the devil face that looks exactly like the actor who plays Adrian. Oh, is that it? I thought it looked like Handsome Squidward. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who that is. Oh, uh, that... it's a it's a meme. It's going oh. around. <laughs> um, I'm not cool enough for you guys. Um, no, I would, I would... you don't know, that means like you're far too. <laughs> you're, you're a lot cooler. You're, you're a lot cooler, cooler than the best. Yeah. I just thought it was a really nice. I don't know. It was a really nice touch for me, and maybe this is my director coming out, but I just loved it, and it looked like that. It was that again, like those really angular features, mm. and it looked just like him, but it also looked exactly like that classic devil face mm -hmm. that you see so much in that. In, in Kaz's friend's uh, satanic imagery. Mm -hmm. What? Yes? <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Yes. Me and my 100% body is, agree. Yeah. No me and my body is just hang out and we just worship in the devil. Yeah, yeah, good. He's, yeah. he's cool. He brings chips. Good, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm pretty much they're, they're inferring that in the sequels, Andrew is going to, to com come. Yeah, he's going to yeah. combat his, uh, his son. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Dad versus boy. Rosemary's oh baby's baby. Yeah. Is this yeah. what is this Rosemary's what Lucas, grandchild? This is what Lucas based Star Wars on. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. This IP. Good. We've salt it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, there, there were not any further sequels. Oh no! Look, this, this didn't look uh, what is continuing to happen to Rosemary's baby. That's what happened. Yeah, with Rosemary's now, baby. Uh, that's what that's what happened. To Rose <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Uh, they did remake Rosemary's Baby uh, as a as a four part mini series in the two thousands with uh, Zoe Saldana. Did you ever watch that? I could not bring myself to watch it. You couldn't bring it, not not even like a like a cursory like ten minutes or so just to see how it how it played out. No, because I I had every intention to, and then I didn't hear good. things. I didn't hear anything. Mm -hmm. I, I just didn't it, it didn't exist so, seemingly. Yeah, I didn't hear good things, so I I felt like ugh, I I'm not down with the remaking that's happening now. I they don't do it well. I would I would be down. I don't 
dislike the idea of remaking these films ideologically. I dislike how poorly Hollywood seems to be executing a lot of them. And I now I've lost full trust. I am terrified to see the new Hocus Pocus film. Like, mm. terrified. <laughs> I'm going to. Um, but I, and, and same with Wednesday. Like, I'm so scared to watch Oh, Wednesday. I'm cautiously optimistic for I know. Wednesday. Well, just I know. Just, just, like, look, like, modern day Tim Burton, uh, not great. He, he shits the bed more often he than, he, than he, he, he pulls out a, a rose or whatever. But, like, uh, I mean, I like, I like the cast. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of, of who they, I love the pairing of Catherine Zeta-Jones and Louise Guzman. That's, I do, that's, yeah. That's whoever was the casting director behind that. Give them a raise. I mean, that's my, great. And, and another boon for Wednesday is that I, I think I saw some preview footage and it, they've, unless I'm mistaken, I think it was Wednesday, they've kept the same, I don't know what they're shooting it on, but it feels like we're in the same world. Like they haven't tried, because mm-hmm. my gripe with a lot of them is they take this old classic idea and you try and make it fucking so shiny and modern and I don't like it. Like I don't, maybe mm-hmm. I'm just, maybe I'm Too just polished, not enough, yeah. ca- not enough character or, or artistry I'm, to it. Yeah. yeah, you know, or like you lose the soul of mm-hmm. what made us love the first film in, in the first place and then, so I'm hopeful with Wednesday. It feels like they've shot it on something and they've, like they're they're trying to keep the the visual storytelling consistent. I'm all for. I that. mean, the thing about the Adams family is there's so many iterations of it, right? Like it's never. No, but I want my iteration. I want the. I want Raul Julian. I want Angelica Houston. And, well, I mean, she's in it. She is. She in is it. in it. She love. is not. I. 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 My. I mean, Catherine Zeta Jones is a great choice for Morticia. I thought it would have made more sense for Christina Ricci to play Morticia, but. That uh, round face, though. A little too much, yeah. yeah. But yeah, no, Wednesday's got Christina Ricci and Thora Birch in it, so it's like the spooky girls of the 90s reunite, respect, you know? Respect, um, I will say uh, uh, Hocus Pocus 2 uh, is not good, but it d- kind of doesn't matter. Like, you watch it and you're yeah. just kind of all like, that was terrible, but also uh, I had so much fun I didn't really care. Sometimes, so. that, sometimes that desire or that nostalgia is so strong that it sort of yeah. allows you... Like with like, I didn't think the new Ghostbusters was perfect. I think there was like a lot of stuff we could have dropped. Finn Wolfhard. Um, but I, <laughs> la, oh God, I hope I never. Sorry, Finn. I think you're a great actor. It's just yeah. Anyway, it was the writing. It wasn't you. Yeah, he switched um, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't yeah. you. It wasn't you. Yeah, he's, um, he's a listener. He's he's yeah. Subscribes. He's a he's a long time listener. Yeah. Um, I forgot my point. I got really distracted with Ghost, the ending. Ghostbusters. Part. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was really good, but like the nostalgia is just so strong. You almost have to watch it first and then take a few months and watch it again to see if it's actually any good. I, I'm just <laughs> a little worried about like these. We're fully off. Off. I was going to talk about here. Do we have we gotta... any, Do we have anything else that we want to mention about Rosemary or look oh, what's happened to Rosemary's Baby? Something that we didn't cover in our discussion. It was a film and it happened. Uh, I wanted to bring up. Yes. Um. <laughs> Because it didn't come up organically, but it was like just one of those what the fuck moments of this movie. At one point during the middle chapter, the cast of us who just seem to be aware of what's going on in the movie at all times, they they're discussing <laughs> Peter as he's like driving to um to to Adrian's help as he's like fighting the bikers. And there's like what what about uh, what about that one? He seems to be trouble and. Roman's like, he will be dealt with. And then we smash cut to, like, an eagle attacking him as he's driving. Yeah. Oh, what yeah. the fuck was that? He's dri- Which, like, a drive-by, and then a hawk comes and attacks him. Drive-by and hawking. It drive-by like, hawking. It couldn't, like, they, they just could not make that look believable. It was, like, <laughs> on his, there was, like, clearly just this thing on strings, and then the other, I felt like I could almost see the hands yeah. just, like, jerking the eagles. <laughs> I just, I just <laughs> these, these guys yeah. have the power to hypnotize people through a phone line or to possess people vehicles it's just he will be dealt with oh i wonder what kind of supernatural dark magic they're gonna summon to get this guy just a fucking bird goes out of him. maybe it was a nod to hitchcock yeah. <laughs> sure that's what it was uh i just want I, my problem as i said earlier is there's there's not enough ruth gordon i mean like look you're gonna not pay you're gordon. gonna pay ruth no. gordon to come back for the sequel she's obviously like the breakout character from the first movie she won an oscar which is so rare for an actor to win an a, uh, an acting award for a horror movie so yeah. it's like one of like the so only rare. times it's happened yeah uh, it's like her and Kathy Bates for Misery, and that's really the only thing I can think of. Uh, Florence Pugh? No, she was not. She no, she was. She hasn't been nominated for a horror movie yet. Okay, but like I'm mean, sure it's bad, but like Midsummer, I mean, she look, no, she did. Oh, I'm so upset. Like there's okay. 
She should have been. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put I'm gonna put a pin in this because I want to come back to that because you've raised an interesting point. But it's like you get you managed to get Ruth Gordon, the breakout star of uh, the breakout star. I mean, she had it was because it was wild because like she had like this such. You a, got the Oscar winner from Rosemary's yeah, Baby. Yeah, and you, you barely give her anything to do. There was one line where I'm like, this is like kind of interesting when they're hiding in the synagogue at the beginning of the movie and they're sort of like astral project uh, projecting what's going on and everything. And and Minnie is all like, I'm seeing them they're in a store and roman's all like yes like they're in they're in a house of worship and she said i told you it was a store and like mm. that's like a, a line that's kind of like a commentary on like yeah, isn't yeah. all religion trying to sell us something mm. man yeah. and it's all like oh man like there could have been way, way more to this character it was just a such a missed oh, opportunity yeah. to bring Minnie back and really give her like nothing to do she doesn't really have any memorable lines mm. she doesn't uh, but she doesn't yeah. have to yeah, like she does. Well, I liked her. I told him it was a terrible gift line when he's getting the knife, yeah. as I said earlier. But that's the kind of character where she doesn't even have to do that much. Like, you, she's just so compelling to watch and to listen to, and yeah. she's so unique that, yeah, I know. It was way Definitely unique too. for this these movies. Mm-hmm. You know, like, all this, like, dark occult shit going yeah, on yeah, in the background. Yeah. And then you have this, like, smart-ass character. Yeah, from yeah. the Bronx. Exactly. Or mm-hmm. something. Yeah, yeah, who just feels like your grandma. Yeah, just, like, absolutely sticks out in the yeah. premise. But you're like, oh, I'm kind of glad that they're bringing something to this. Again, well, that's what makes the first original film so... They just... they It's like they took everything that made the original film good, and they're like, okay, but let's do it without all that. <laughs> yeah. And, and like, it was like... Would you again, say it misses the point? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, it's grounding the, the horror in this really plausible... Space. Okay, oh, okay, yeah. we, we, yeah. Got, we gotta wrap this up. So, uh, quick, so like, oh god, there's so many. This movie movies. has a step. Yeah, this, this movie has a certain something, or is, or is it a whole lot of nothing? This movie has a whole lot of nothing. Yeah, this, this movie sucks. Nothing. Yeah, this a movie's not very nothing. good. Yeah. But, uh, like, what a study. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, of, what of a study a on how to really fuck an IPF. Yeah. <laughs> of, of, of a place in time. Uh, <laughs> Steph, it sucks that you have to go. There's so many other topics that I, I want to talk to you about. It just means we'll have to have you back yeah. uh, at yeah, some point. Yeah, please come back. Uh, you know, too. this is our this is our Halloween episode, but uh, as we said earlier, this podcast is kind of more about uh, the careers of actors. So if there's if there's an actor that you ever want to talk about, uh, and we'll we'll try and find like the most obscure movie that they've done. Open invitation to come back anytime you Ooh, want. Yeah. Um, why don't you take this opportunity now to to plug anything that you want to plug, anything you got coming up, anything you want people to check out? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So everybody can check out Blockbuster. It's going to be premiering on Netflix November third. Um, but the last Blockbuster in America. Uh, my film consumer, you can follow us on Instagram consumer, the at consumer, the film, um, we're going to be screening. If you're in the Vancouver area, we're going to be screening at the Vancouver horror show, November six to eight, maybe fifth to six. It's sometime in November. Um, Strike when the iron's hot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, but, uh, it's going to be screening also on super channel as part of the blood in the snow. A festival which will be announced by the time this comes out, I hope. I'm not supposed to announce it yet, but this is not coming out tomorrow, right? No. Okay. Oh, God, no. Okay. No, 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 no. We yeah. take way too long to edit these okay, things. Okay, great, 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 yeah. great, great. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. uh, fantastic. Yeah. Great. Cool. Uh, I guess, well, let's, yeah, let's wrap this, wrap this thing up. That was... Uh, Look What's Happened to Rosemary's Baby, directed by Sam Osteen. If you enjoyed this episode, please listen to our other episodes. Uh, We're available on Spotify and YouTube. Uh, If you watch us on YouTube, there's a visual element to uh, uh, this podcast, uh, what we talk about. Uh, Jameson adds all these uh, images and stuff, so you you have a visual idea of what we're talking about, who we're talking about, and everything. Uh, We'd like to thank Thank Eddie Lamb for our amazing theme music, and uh, that's it. And uh, should we announce the next uh, trilogy? Oh yeah, go ahead. That we that we talked about. Go for it. Uh, so uh, next, uh, our, our next uh, group of movies that we're going to be discussing about, we're going to be talking about the nothing movies of Whoopi Goldberg. Addendum: the voice performances, mm-hmm. just Whoa. her animated uh, slash live action uh, voice performances. We're gonna we're, we we found three movies uh, that all have like a connection in, in that regard. So that'll be the next trilogy that we do. Mm. And then after that, we have a special Christmas episode for you. Yeah. And then uh, holy shit, 2022 is over. Yeah. And, uh, went like that. Halloween went like that. Halloween went uh, very fast. Yeah. Yes. 
Uh, but there we go. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, the end of uh, another episode. So, uh, for nothing mo- nothing spookies. Mm-hmm. So, I'm going to miss saying that. Yeah. I'm miss saying that. One so more year. Much. One, One more year. Go. Nothing spookies. Uh, I'm Kaz. I'm Jameson. Uh, R.I.P. Coolio, your nemesis. Oh, yes. R.I.P. Coolio. <laughs> My goodness. And yeah. R- R- A man R- who you once described as a worthy opponent. <laughs> R- and R.I.P. to, I guess, like our longest running joke on this podcast where I I, I continue to maintain that I have a long running feud with Coolio. Yeah. Well, God, what am I going to do boy, now? What am I going to you know, joke about now? About a month ago, you were saying, like, I'll be rid of that Coolio once and for all. What exactly did you mean by that, Kaz? I, yeah, need, to, I, need, to, I need to go back and need to edit that out of that <laughs> yeah, podcast. All right. Well, that's, anyways, that's, that's Kaz. I'm Jameson. And uh, to, to send you off, uh, here's a line from the movie. Adrian! That's that's them, right? That they're the ones that came up with that. Hey, come to think of it, Rocky came out in 1976, two years after this movie came out. Mm-hmm. Hey, they got I, a lawsuit on their they hands. They got a lawsuit. Watch your back, Stallone. All right, later, All guys. Right, bye. <laughs> <laughs>